So I'd like to thank you all for being here. We appreciate it. Um, we do have a few survivors in the house today. Clive Doyle is in the audience. We have um, Heather Jones Burson is in the audience. And I see Sheila Martin in the audience as well. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for being there. And at some point, um, I hope, hope some of you get up and say a few words. Um, I want to talk about, you know, just the, the, this is about remembering the people that died all those years ago. And um, there was such a kind of, with, with the press being used by the government, there was so much demonization that happened against our group that it was really hard to you know even get people to listen to any of the survivors who came out of that building uh, the majority of the people just had written us off as mind controlled cultists uh, kind of our our opinions were going to be totally skewed and one-sided because you know we were we were we were there that we had learned the scripture through david koresh so therefore you know we couldn't be objective and many, many years of that, uh, it went on and on and on. The, there's this, a, a saying, uh, there's a saying that I like to quote quite a bit. It says, Senator Henry Clay said back in the 1800s, um, the devices of power and its minions are the same in all countries and in all ages. First, it marks its victim and denounces it, exciting the public hatred to conceal its own abuses and encroachments. And so that is what has, you know, occurred uh, that they did such a great job of using words like cult, cultist, compound. It wasn't a house, the place, it was a compound. Um, the snipers weren't snipers, they were forward observers. Um, tanks weren't tanks, they were called CEVs. I think Janet Reno said, hey, could you, uh, people on the Zoom call, if you could please mute yourselves, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Janet Reno called the tanks good rent-a-cars they were basically good rent-a-cars because the turrets were taken off you know okay um some of the tanks did have turrets and booms that were attached to those tanks so in the last day when they went into the building they could basically take sections of the building out on the second story and blow cf gas in there we know and there's some pictures i can show later of tanks going through the front door tanks going through the area where the concrete structure was all the way through the very front of the building, all the way to the back of the concrete structure, which was the walk-in cooler. And that's where all the kids were placed under wet blankets to try to escape the gas and the fire. And, um, you know, tanks went all the way back there through the building and put in a massive amount of CS gas into the little small concealed concrete structure where the kids were. So that, um, then they wonder why people didn't come out. Well, it's hard to come out when, you know, you have tiny little lungs and you're being literally gassed to death, literally gassed to death. So, you know, I mean, when I think of the last moments that those people in, in the concrete structure had to adore, it's, um, I actually don't think of it often because it's, 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 it's very hard to keep that thought in your head. Um, what I do remember of the of the last day is uh, serenity. And I remember going up to her and trying to get a, find a gas mask that would fit her. And I remember one little tear coming out of the side of her eye. And that was, you know, during the gassing was, that was early in the day, you know, and it was just, that was, that was devastating. And so one of the things I wanna talk about before I open it up to some, any survivors that might like to come up in here and say things is, I think in how this government, many governments, military, they're trained to do a job. They're not trained to think about the loved ones or the family members of those that are gonna be killed or lost. They're trained to do a job and that's to get that job done no matter what the cost is. They don't see serenity's tears. They don't see or hear the kids choking from the CS gas in a tiny room. They're just doing their job. When I think of what's happening in the world today with Ukraine, and I think of one man basically holding the world hostage right now, which is what it appears to be Putin, and how he can order people to go in and do just horrendous things that are happening right now. Um, 
this is where I wish that people could stop and think about their actions and what they're doing. That you're not just doing, you're not just performing an order. You're not doing what your government is asking you to, but you're CS gassing children. There wasn't one FBI agent in that tank. One, there wasn't someone on the ground that said, you know, hey, this is wrong. We should not do this. So I want to get people to think, especially younger people who maybe could easily be swayed into the military or, 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 or getting an order that they have to do that is against their consciousness. I say, don't do it. I say your conscience, your consciousness and your, your connection with God, your connection with humanity is ultimately more important than when any order you can get to hurt other fellow human beings. And one of the things that really kind of affected me when the series came out, and it's been on the back of my mind for a long time, is the series made many people very angry because for the first time they're seeing a visual of what happened to Mount Carmel for 29 years, right? 28 years. All people did was think that a bunch of religious fanatics wanted to kill themselves, as Clinton said. So what can the federal government do about that? Well, when you get to know the people individually and personally, and you start to learn some of the stories, you start to see, hey, these were, these were human beings. These were people that their religion may not been, have been like mine is, but they worship the Bible. You know, I gave a talk recently, not too long ago in Allen, Texas. Um, most of the people in the crowd were over 50. None of them had seen the series, but I just showed a slideshow presentation as I was going through that and I was explaining there were people in the audience that were surprised that the people at Mount Carmel studied the Bible. A lot of times, you know, like the, the parallels were drawn between Charles Manson and David Koresh, and it's always put in this kind of nice little, there's this leader, right? The people are kind of, I mean, not too bright. They need someone to follow, and they're following this guy unto death. That's kind of the scenario that America and the world's been given through the press. But the truth is, there's many different individuals that are there that are there for their own reasons, and in some cases, some people were with David for years and years and years. In some cases, some of the people there were with the community for decades. A community that started in the '50s, and through Brother Hadith, uh, Ben Roden, Lois Roden, all the way up to Vernon Howell, who then chose or was given the name David Koresh, um, followed a succession, okay? and each person that was out there and what they consider to be a new light or a new truth. And each person that came thereafter built the foundation of the previous person and then continued on up to David teaching the seventh angel's message. So this wasn't a fly by night thing. This is something that had existed for many, many years out in Waco and out in the community. So, um, you know, I just want people to be aware that there's a depth they didn't realize. When I gave the talk in Allen, after the talk, I had so many people that didn't realize that the community were, were literally studying the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I mean, that blew my mind that, that people didn't realize that, that a lot of the people in Mount Carmel were actually really truly studying the scripture. There was a Jewish family that was in the audience. And they said, when they found out that we kept the Sabbath and that we kept the feast, the feast days of God, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, the Atonement, um, Passover, uh, they were shocked. They couldn't believe it. They were like, wow, they kept the Sabbath. So that was a big deal to, you know, this one particular Jewish family. So to me, all these years later, even after the series, it's amazing what people don't know about what happened to Mount Carmel. And so that's what we're going to continue on trying to get the word out and trying to humanize the people. Um, at noontime, we're gonna start reading the list of names of those that died. I have an additional list of not only uh, survivors that died, but I also wanna read a list later of all the um, supporters throughout the years of the group that have passed on since. And I wanna read, I wanna read their names as well because what amazing people, the thing about Mount Carmel and Waco and this, this whole experience is we met, I, I believe I can speak for Clive, Heather, and, and everyone. We've met some real devils through this, <laughs> but we've also met some literal angels on earth through this. So we've met the best people and the worst people. And meeting the best people make up for everything. It really does, to me anyway. And so 
some of the people that, you know, you got to remember the whole world was conditioned to hate this group of people, my group of people, Clive, myself, Heather. They were conditioned to be negative toward them, okay? And you still had people that came out that just said, you know what? As I'm a Christian, fundamentally, everything that happened here is wrong. And, you know, I may not believe like they do, but I want to support them. Now, those are very brave individuals when you think that the most of the world is headed one way and you have a group of people that, you know, have supported through the years um, what happened here and us and befriended us when nobody else even wanted to be you know, our friends. That's that's pretty amazing to me. And those people are very special. And so uh, Clive Doyle and I sat down last night and we, we made a list of them. And, and I'd like to read that list later on. Um, I'll probably do it before. I'd like to read that list before noon. And then we'll do the, the people that actually died at Mount Carmel. So, okay. Um, I feel like I've done quite a bit of talking there. I do thank everyone for being here. There are some people here in person at the um, Taylor Museum of Waco History. And the Zoom, it seems like there are a lot of people on the Zoom. Those that came late, I am sorry for, for the link situation. A lot of it went to my chunk mail and I just checked it uh, just before we started. So I apologize for the late links on those. Um, it's, do we know if just James Tabor in yet, Kathy? James, are you here? And if you are, can you unmute so I can see you? I think there's a lot of people and I can't see. I'll tell you what. Hey, Scott, how are you doing today, my friend? Would you like to say a few words? Um, actually, I could um, speak on your military uh, comment that you made there, that question that you, you had. So can I, can I introduce you first? This is Scott Mab, everybody. He is... Um, he was one of the children that was at Mount Carmel. He, um, Michael Schroeder was his stepfather. So I'm gonna have, uh, I'd like you to speak about Mike too, but yeah, definitely please make a comment. I'd love to hear it. Absolutely. Um, hello everybody. I hope everyone can hear me fine. Um, I was about 10 roughly when all this happened. Uh, we were there from 89 to 93. Uh, I was there for, so about three years of pretty uh, important years of childhood. Um, I do have uh, pretty vivid memories of Waco, um, a lot of good ones, a few bad ones, but mostly good ones. Um, Thibodeau just asked a question in his subject he was talking about with the, the military service. The, the great topic with Waco is, you know, community of religious people, government. You've got these two sides. What was done? What happened? What went wrong? Why did it go wrong? All these questions that get asked in the public and stuff like that. Um, but one thing that um, I've been uh, asked questions of before is that I'm a somewhat of a unique case in that I ended up serving in the military years after this. Once I became an adult, I then signed up for the Air Force, served four and a half years and got an honorable discharge. Um, the question that uh, Thibodeau brought up was, if you're given a order that you don't uh, deem as moral, what do you do? Um, I 100% agree with Tibbs here. You don't, uh, you don't follow the order. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I only spent four and a half years in the Air Force, because I'm not that type of person who will just blindly follow directions. <clears throat> I question everything. I'm a, my, my mother made me very open-minded. Um, allow me to think for myself, determine whether or not the input that I'm getting from other humans around me is input that I should be listening to or not. Uh, this is something that uh, people in the military or any other kind of um, authoritative force should always consider. Uh, right now in this country, we've had over the last few years, we've had a lot of issue with, you know, our cops doing what they're supposed to be doing. So it, it, it the subject branches out into many things, but for specific to Waco, you know, we look at these agents on the ground who actually came in and, and attacked these peaceful people. Why did they do that? What was their thinking? What was going on in their head that they chose to actually do this? And while we can sit there and say, well, they should have just not followed these orders if this was Im an immoral action. It's not quite that simple. Um, like Tibbs also mentioned, the uh, conditioning of the media. Um, having served, I know exactly 
how that happens in the military. I mean, down to basic training, you go through six weeks or X amount, depending on what branch you're in, of conditioning. That's literally what basic training is all about. It is there to break you down and reprogram you to follow their directions. So this happened with Waco. Um, I can fully believe and, and see how every agent on the ground there was conditioned to believe what they were doing was moral. So personally, I don't hold any necessary fault with the actual individual agents in that sense. I mean, I would hope that the better humans could still, even through conditioning, determine that this was immoral, but it, to me at least, relieves some of that fault on them. And I, it, for me personally, it puts it more at the people giving the orders. Anyone giving an order that seems immoral should be the one at fault for it. But we as people do need to stand up and say, hey, we don't see this as, or we don't see this as moral. This doesn't seem right. Why are we doing this? And start questioning things. That's my big thing that I like to talk about. Always question things for yourself and determine if it's the best way to go. Um, the conditioning of the media thing, we see that into today. This is why I like the subject of speaking about Waco because it's relative, it's relevant today. This happened 20, 30 years ago, but we're seeing the same thing still. We're still seeing the same thing go on in this country when it comes to conditioning of thought. People's, if we put on the media and the news 24 seven, X, Y, or Z, that's what the people are gonna think about. We post you know, stuff on the internet about cops doing bad stuff all the time. Everybody's gonna think that all cops are bad when that is far from the truth. So. Keep that in mind, understand that there's a lot more deeper um, factors that went into everything that transpired in Waco and that we need to be aware of the, the fact, we need to be aware of the factors in order to try to make our society better moving forward in the future. Um, as far as, <laughs> What happened in Waco, um, my biggest, the, the thing that I hate to see the most was that there were things that were completely overlooked. Um, the issues of my stepfather, um, something I speak on when we do these memorials. We liked, or, or I don't say we like to, that's wrong wording. We often talk about the 51 days the fire at the end, all those people who died in that fire, the children, these are all very important things, but we overlook some other factors because there were other people involved. Like Tib said too, we have a lot of supporters over the years who have gotten involved and we appreciate them just as much as the people who you know, suffered back then. Um, I think we need to also look at all aspects of what happened in Waco. My stepfather, Mike, was off, pre off premises with some other individuals as well. Once they got news, they headed back. Given all the evidence, all the you know, actual physical evidence, the autopsies, everything that's come to light since then, it is my firm belief that he was legitimately executed for no reason. He had several shots around his body and then two to his temple. Nobody who looks at that whole situation can say that that made any sense, that that was necessary. Uh, my memories of Mike was that he was a very peaceful man. He was not a violent man. Um, he was a family man, a caring man. So he would have been making an effort to simply get back to his family. Uh, he wouldn't have been trying to do anything with these agents. He would have just wanted to get to his family. So they stopped him from doing that. Um, Mike was, for lack of better words, a great man. Um, he was a drummer. He was a mechanic, he was an artist, he was somebody that I looked up to, um, someone that I try to emulate, that's the word I'm looking for, um, someone I try to emulate in my life. I try to be capable in all areas that I need to be, and that's the type of guy he was. He was a man of faith, he loved his family, but he loved God more. <laughs> that's what led him and my mom down the path that 
made, got us involved with Waco. Um, he should be memor he should be remembered as that, as should all these people who suffered at the hands of our government during Waco in 93. Myself, I'm now 40, so it's been a while. I've grown up, I've become an adult, I have kids of my own. I look back at these scenarios and wonder what could I do? Obviously as a 10 year old at the time of Waco, there wasn't a whole lot that I could do, but now I feel like I'm obligated to do something. So speaking about things, educating people, like Tib said, making sure that people know the truth. There are still so many people out there who have no idea what happened or they completely believe the, the media narrative of the time. That's what I liked about the series, bringing light to the fact that these people were not just religious crazy people. They were human beings just like everyone else. And that also has a lot of parallels with issues that we have in our country as well as the world today. Um, I want to spread truth. I want to make sure everyone knows the information that we can prove and that we have evidence of to be true and not just the propaganda that was put out by our by our media. Um, I also Scott, wanted to thank everybody and the mother. supporters because you guys are so important and we appreciate you. Go ahead, Tips. So I was just wondering, um, we didn't really introduce who your mother was, so maybe you can talk about her for a second. Uh, my mother, Catherine, she's here, but she is uh, kind of in and out. She's working right now. So if she has a moment from work to speak, I'm sure she'll gladly do that, but uh, she's a little busy. So uh, my mom... <sighs> one of the most intelligent people I've ever known my entire life. A woman of faith. She has always been a family mom, a family person. She, just like Mike, that's why the two of them were so good together, loved her family, but loved God more. That's what took them down that path to Waco. Um, since the event, she has, she went through a lot. She went through a lot of difficult things. I have several siblings, um, myself, Jake and Chrissy, and then Brian, who was born at the time. Um, Brian ended up going to his grandmother and me, myself, Jake and Chrissy went to my father. She was, she felt safe in that me and my older two siblings had someone there to take care of us, <clears throat> but she was not, she felt concerned for Brian. So she wanted to make sure she could get out of there to take care of him, uh, which is perfectly understandable as he no longer would have had any, either parent had she not gotten out of there. Um, she, her beliefs led her to want to stay with the people and, 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 and foresee the prophecy, whatever it may be. But she had <laughs> concerns in that regard. I'm grateful that she did, <laughs> or she would not be here with us. <sighs> she is <laughs> a wonderful human who has gone through a lot. And I understand her perspectives and appreciate her. I actually just had a little powwow with her last night. Anytime I'm struggling with things in life, anytime that I need guidance, I go to her for her input. I hope she could talk a little bit today, but I will do my best to uh, fill those shoes. And um, I will be around after everything is all done as well for some time if anyone wants to speak to me directly. So I don't want to keep everyone hold up, held up too long. So anyone else would like to speak? Okay, thank you so much, Scott, for, for speaking. I appreciate that. I can't get it to work. <laughs> okay, great. I, I see that James Tabor's in the audience and I know that he has a class to teach. So if James, would you like to say a couple words? Really love to uh, hear from you today if you, uh, if you have a second. I would, thank you. Dave. 
Thank you. Thank you, Scott, so much for that. Um, meant a lot to me. So <laughs> just to, I, I got in late. I, I just uh, I had a class of 80 students today. They're freshmen and sophomores. Not all of them were born 29 years ago. So I started the class. It's religious studies, but I can cover what I want, especially today. So I started the class by asking, who's heard of the following terms? Waco, Texas, David Koresh, Branch Davidian, those three. Out of 80, it was just, it feels you know like we have here 40. It, you can get 49 on a Zoom screen. So I had to go back and forth. I quickly counted uh, five had heard of it, which I think is sad. The other thing is I thought that the uh, Netflix, I know it was produced by Paramount, but I thought that the Netflix uh, production would raise the consciousness a little bit, but I think we've been bombarded with so much media, so many streaming series, but at least it's out there. And I thought the actors did such a wonderful job. Tib told me that there were moments when Taylor was performing that he got chills uh, in terms of somebody being able to kind of pick up on so I showed the class uh, a PBS interview that I had done just because it's six minutes. I sent it to David this morning. They mainly laughed at how I looked 29 years ago, you know, thinner, darker hair, all that. <laughs> but uh, it was a pretty good little summary because I was asked by a, you know, NPR, just come back from the con congressional hearings in 95. And uh, she's basically just asking me, well, what went on and what did you do and how do you assess it? So it's on my YouTube channel if you wanna, it's hard to find, but I was able to pull it along with the Waco hearings. But my YouTube channel is, uh, you know, those URLs are crazy, but James Tabor videos, if you go to YouTube, it'll come up right away. There's a whole section on Waco. But my main thing to mention to you all today, besides uh, a great deal of love and care for everybody, is that I want you all to be aware that Phil Arnold, uh, three years ago, spent a great deal of money, many thousands of dollars, to have a studio professional recording of Kathy Wessinger, of me, he was a participant in Stuart Wright, a three-hour discussion of everything we knew about Waco at the time. And of course, you can't cover everything. Kathy has it on her YouTube broken down. I just put the whole thing up on mine. It's not monetized, so I don't know. They probably still stick ads in, but it's free. Phil wants anybody to use it. Uh, I'd love any of you to watch it and email Kathy or me or David Tibido or anybody with any kind of a extra input, because maybe we'd do a follow-up, any corrections, any mistakes we made. But it was basically all the things, and it's very well outlined, you know, everything from what happened on the 28th, you know, to just all the way through to the day after the fire. And so that is out there, and I want you all to be aware of it. One thing I was reminded of in playing that little PBS video that I played for my class today is I commented it was sponsored by the Republicans, and the Democrats hated us for just for being sort of pro Davidian. And I was just, it just reminded me that even back then in 95, the Congress was divided. I remember Chuck Schumer walking around eating his sandwich. He was a congressman then, not a senator. And uh, my wife gave up, gave, went up to him and gave him our book, uh, Why Waco. And he's like chewing his sandwich and going, oh, well, thank you, thank you. I'll try to read it, you know. I hope he did. <laughs> I don't know if he ever did. I know, 
I'm not taking sides here, Republican or Democrat, but it was funny to me, the PBS interviewer said, well, how did the congressional hearing go? How did they take your testimony? Arnold and I both testified and Dick DeGaron and Jack Zimmerman and quite a few people that day. And I said, well, the Republicans seem to love it and all the Democrats hated it. And she said, she didn't ask me why, but now looking back on what we've been through the last few years with in our country in terms of division, I realize now that that had nothing to do with Waco or the subject. The Republicans loved it because it was anti-Clinton and anti-Reno. And, and the Democrats hated it because it was uh, political. And I was just reminded of that today, how important that is, you know, how this has become politicized, particularly with Oklahoma and militia groups and so forth. And I just wanted to get back to kind of the Bible study group. Scott just mentioned how Kathy, as a woman of faith, and I spent hours and hours talking to, I don't even like to call them survivors, but people who are still around who understood what it was to study with David Koresh. And whether you agree or disagree or follow it now or believe it now or whatever, people were there because they loved the Bible, they loved the prophecies of the Bible, and they got very intrigued with this person. I always remember Steve talking about this with Arnold and with me, you know, when we were trying to get the FBI to understand that we're here because this man, we studied the Bible for years, and we have this man that we've met that is going through and explaining it verse by verse. I mean, start in Isaiah 40 and go through Isaiah 66 and cover every verse and talk about every image, every illusion, every phrase. Uh, is it all right? Is it all wrong? You know, everybody's got to decide, but it is not some incoherent bunch of cultic foolishness. It's what we would call in our field a systematic theology. David had a systematic theology. It's grounded in Adventism and in the Hatef movement and in the Rodents and so forth on up. But it was a systematic theology that had a structure and meaning to it. And that's what we began to learn. And I'll share this with you as a memory. When I published my book, Why Waco in 95, I spent two years listening to all of the negotiation tapes before I wrote it uh, as, and reading all the transcripts. But I also listened to many, many dozens of hours of David teaching in homes and uh, other kinds of settings in the early days, whatever I could get. And one of the series I got, and I don't even remember where I got all these, Thibodeau, you might have given me some, they were cassette recordings of teachings, but it was going through Isaiah 40 through 66, that's why I mentioned that, verse by verse. And you know what? I would have prided myself before hearing those tapes on knowing that text pretty much backwards and forwards. And I just have to say a couple of times I stopped the tape and took some deep breaths. And I said to myself, oh my God. Not because I believed it, because, but because I was being drawn into an experience of what a five hour Bible study could be like. Now, who ever would want to sit in a five hour Bible study? Come on, this is like mentally ill, right? Not if you are unraveling a whole set of terminology. You know, I remember David said, who is that bird from the East? You know, you, everybody that doesn't know it, bird from the East, what are you even talking about? Where else do we read about a bird from the East? We actually have five other passages in the Bible. Let's go look at those. You see, it was this sort of interweaving. And that's what the FBI could not understand. It had to be child molesting, multiple wives, arms, hoarding, you know. It couldn't be some really, really amazing human beings that loved the Bible and felt that they were learning it. I personally have other views of the Bible that are 
much more liberal uh, in terms of critical biblical studies and so forth. But that doesn't mean I couldn't appreciate what David did. So that's what I'm thinking about uh, 29 years later. I did buy the web domain Waco1993.com. I haven't put it up yet, but I purchased it and didn't seem to be in high demand. So I grabbed it and I'm going to keep it. And I do want to slowly build that site with my son's help. He, he's a web designer. And I would like, you know, to eventually put up there either links or resources, because now you've got to go to so many places to get things. And it could be videos, it could be transcript links, uh, just as a one-stop shop for all things Waco. I'm retiring July 1st after 45 years of teaching. I look young, don't I? <laughs> so I'm 76 years old and I'm happily retiring. And this is one of the things I wanna do. I want to uh, bring together resources. Uh, I don't really have other news. I'm excited about uh, Ryan's work. I'm excited about Jeff uh, Gwen and the book that he's planning. Of course, you never know that something comes out. I wonder about the 30 year anniversary and we're all so gun shy. I know that's a bad term to use with Waco, but you know what I mean? Sort of like we jump like that. When you get a call from NBC or ABC or the History Channel or Discovery or PBS and they go, oh, it's the 30th anniversary of Waco. We wanna do a show. So what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna to try to get an article published in the Atlantic. I think that would be the most prestigious. The New Yorker has already done a really fabulous article on the Waco disaster, remember a few years ago. But the Atlantic, as far as I know, has not ever, and the Atlantic is the most influential magazine in America right now in terms of just, and I'm gonna to try to get a retrospective 30 year Waco article in the Atlantic that will tell some of the truth in a, in a different way than it's been told. Uh, that's one of the things I'm gonna do. I'm also, I also have a contract with Cambridge University Press to do a book on Sabbatarian movement, this, the movement of people who keep the seventh day Sabbath all the way back to the roots in England in the 1700s. But I wanna mainly focus on uh, 20th and 21st century groups because it's just mushroomed. So those are some of the things I'm doing, but um, I don't know. It gets discouraging. But, but the gun shy part I didn't explain. Most of you know what I meant. Is you agree to do one of these things, and you spend hours and you fly in the interview. David, how many have you done? I've done at least 20 of them over the years. You know, shows. And count them all. I'm never. I, I think, was it the A&E was one of the ones we did on the 25th that seemed is sort of okay, but they're just so horrible because they all want to focus in on David's face, make his eyes really big and crazy, play weird music, and do the Jim Jones cult thing, and the, you know, just this, and nobody wants to talk about why people were really there, and who these human beings were, and how totally unnecessary their deaths were totally unnecessary so so that's you know my spiel this morning i'll keep listening to you guys as long as i can i've got a class at hey. one o'clock eastern thank, thank you, you so much Shane, for, for that oh let me add <laughs> thibodeau in an interview after the paramount pictures came out Remember that interview you did? I forgot the guy in New York or something, but you had all the actors and everybody there. So they asked Tim, uh, well, it's been all these years now. What would you, what would you mo if you could go back in time, what would you most like to see? And he said, I would most like to see James Tabor and Phil Arnold come to Mount Carmel Center and spend like four or five days studying the Bible back and forth with Koresh, and we all got to listen. <laughs> so that's what, and I know Phil and I 
would give anything for that. I see Dudley Goff here too. Let's be sure and recognize him. Sure, Dudley absolutely. goes all the way back to 1959. And the other great disappointment of uh, at Passover, expecting uh, the end times during the hot tef period. Thank you, David. Thank you, James. Um, a bird from the East, Todd Clive, that brings back some memories. Uh, the Isaiah stuff uh, that uh, that James was talking about is uh, just just phenomenal stuff. It's um, you know when you go through that and break that down verse by verse, and that that's one of the keys. I'm I'm glad that you brought that up, James. That's what David did. He harmonized chapter upon chapter. He went verse for verse. It wasn't just you know you take out one little segment of scripture and then create a sermon around that. The sermon was all of the scripture, and that's what you know most people don't really understand. One thing I wanted to say, uh, James, you were talking about the A&E documentary and a lot of these documentaries that are done, they're highly sensationalized. So like James said, they'll, they'll slow, they'll have David Crush playing the guitar and they'll slow the video down to make them, you know, guitarists make some really funny places, faces when they're playing anyway, but you slow it down and you can easily make it look like it's some de de demonic trance or something like that. And that's, they did that consistently. The problem I have with just about every documentary are the twofold. One, they focus on the end as being um, a conflagration started by the people on the inside. There's never any room for debate on that because that's a conclusion they draw. They don't talk about the pyrotechnic devices that were found in the, in the building that were in the evidence locker that were mislabeled silencers. Six or seven pyrotechnic devices were used. The FBI claimed for years and years and years there were no pyrotechnic devices used at Mount Carmel, period. Over and over, that's their claim. Yet there's pyrotechnic devices found in, in, in the building. These are just things, they don't talk about these in the documentaries. They don't talk about the fact that CS gas, the propellant is methylene chloride. They don't talk about the fact that CS gas is a powder. They don't mention the fact that if you see a picture of the building, and I can show one later, that all the debris has been moved and the tanks have gone around, around, around in a circle and created a fire break. So nothing can burn past the building. I believe all these things were personally intentionally done. And just about everything they say can be refuted, but we're never given the chance to do that. And that's one of the problems that I have with the A&E one was pretty good because they interviewed Roger. They got a little bit deeper with some of the people that did survive and did know David and didn't know other people in the group. You know, and that, that's important is to, you know, you have to, have to take a little depth with Mount Carmel you have to take a little time to try to understand the mindset of the people inside. If you're living add, in... David, I wanted to add, just before you go on on that, remember when Senator Danford, when, when some of that came out, and there was this huge thing to get Senator Danford to do a new investigation of the fire on the pyrotechnic devices, and they came to Charlotte. I was where I live now, UNC Charlotte, I still here after all these years. And I spent four days with them, with the team, not the Senator, but his research team. And then when the report came out, I was just so surprised that nothing that I had given them was, was, was really in the report. You know, it was basically a rehashing of the same thing. And I kind of had hope that something would be different, but, uh, Anyway, yeah, it sounds like other reports in the past, JFK, there's all kinds of, you know, it, it, <laughs> it just seems that they often don't get everyone's perspective when they're doing reports like this. It's, it's like I've always said, the system takes care of itself. The system is going to protect itself. And, you know, that's what I find more often than not. Um, I mean, again, thank you so much for being here, James. Heather, would you like to say anything? Would you like to talk about your dad for a minute? Okay. It's 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 not a prerequisite. Um, Clive, how are you doing? You all right? Is that from trouble here? I'll try to talk louder. You want to say anything or? No. Okay. Um, let me go back to the view here. 
I know um, I had a speaker that was scheduled today. Um, James Tabor mentioned him earlier. Ryan as a veto is, I've been working on a project for a very long time with a uh, documentary. Uh, Ryan's a very special individual. He was uh, raised Seventh-day Adventist. So he actually has a, a unique understanding of, of the foundation of this, of this, of the, what the Davidians are, were. Um, so it's very interesting. He's uh, he's sick and he was so sick. You couldn't even get out of bed to get on the plane. So I'm um, very sorry, Ryan isn't here today. And let's all pray that he gets, he starts feeling better. Uh, I see uh, Stuart Wright is here. Um, I don't know if Stuart feels like saying anything. I'd love to invite him, however. Um, Stuart has done some amazing work. I don't see his face though, so. You don't see my face? No. <laughs> is he there? <laughs> I swear, Anybody how you doing else today? see my face? Yeah. Yeah, we see it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? Where? When he when he speaks, his his frame will light up. And if you put it in um, you can do speaker view or gallery view. If you want to see him big on the whole screen, you can go to speaker view. Yeah, yeah. that's what I see. Or, or you can just pin him. Yeah, you can pin him. Anyway, start talking, Stuart. Yeah, I just came back from my um, from my intro class. I let him out a little early so I could cheat and uh, get uh, uh, get to this Zoom meeting. Uh, David, I, I I was looking at some. Uh, documentaries on Waco uh, in, in the uh, YouTube channels. Um, and I, I came across one, I think it was in 2013, and you were speaking and uh, gosh, you had long hair and you were really thin and, and uh, much younger and uh, <laughs> looked, looked really good. Yeah, those days are gone. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> There he is, finally. Now I can see you. Now you can see me. So, yeah, Stuart, you've done some amazing work. Uh, really, I've been a huge fan. So as a, a, many friends of mine, um, I have all, all of the writings that I know of on, on the website, Waco Survivors. And I encourage people all the time to go there and please read Stuart's work. You know, I, you did something very interesting to me. And I think, as I recall, you asked the question, how come the FBI didn't have a guidebook they could have followed to make sure that everyone came out of the building? And you did a pretty exhaustive analysis of that guidebook that you found out that they did have one. And you found that many of the principles they were supposed to use in negotiation, if they wanted people to come out of the building safely, that they directly violated. And I was just wondering if maybe you could speak to that for a minute or two. What I came across, David, was the uh, protocols for how to conduct uh, hostage barricade incidents um, that the uh, HRT had been using for decades and uh, was actually teaching uh, other law enforcement officers and agents from all around the world on how to conduct these uh, incidents. And what I found was, uh, I think, 17 violations of their own protocols uh, at Waco. And uh, so I was trying to make the point that, you know, um, uh, some pundits and observers were saying that um, that the some of the violations were accidents or uh, uh, lack of communication. And what I was trying to show is that if you just had a couple of these violations of their own protocols, you could write that off. But 17, I think you have to come to the conclusion that that was deliberate. And so I titled the, uh, the, the article, and I'm happy to share that with anybody. It was published in the Journal of Terrorism and Political Violence in 1999. I titled it Anatomy of a Government Massacre. I didn't make a lot of friends with the FBI with that. I wouldn't think. Um, that was that that article that was absolutely very eye-opening. And um, boy, 17, I've been saying 11. It's, it's a lot more. Um, there's so many uh, twists and turns to this thing. It's very easy to lose sight of, of, of things. But um, yeah, it's just amazing to me that there's their guidebook. They directly didn't follow it and expected an outcome, um, a positive outcome. Like they kept saying over and over again, 
that we're going to do whatever it takes to get everyone out of that building. We're going to do whatever it takes. We're going to do whatever, whatever it takes. Well, I'm going against the principles that have been proven to work in the past in negotiations that that's not doing whatever it takes. That seems that you're actually wanting the people to stay in that building. You know, another thing that, that I'd like to talk about briefly is the aggressive acts of the government. And I said last year in the, in the Zoom more that we did, at every single step along the way of this thing, the government was the aggressors. At no time were we the aggressors other than in the self-defense of the building on the very first day. So they set up speaker systems and they tried to sleep deprive us. They had bright lights. The helicopters were buzzing the building constantly. The tanks with that metallic sound of the treads going around the building consistently, all these incredible sounds were to keep us in there or to keep us in that building and not wanting to come out, thus fulfilling the prophecy of the scripture and David's proph prophecy all along. So, you know, the question's been asked by many of the scholars and many of, you know, the people that are deeply involved in this. If you wanted the people to come out, then why would you put the pressure on? Why would you make David's message truer and, and, and thus solidify the people even more inside as the tight knit group? And that's exactly what, you know, the government did. It went on and on. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, I do encourage people to go to uh, Waco Survivors and look at Stewart's work. You know, I noticed that we have another friend here, Dudley Goff. I don't know if Dudley, do you want to speak for a minute? Dudley was a former Davidian under, or you may still be a Davidian, but I know he stuttered under, did you stutter under on our hot off, Dudley? Yes, I did, David. And I'll be glad to say a little bit, you know, uh, I think I supply a little different uh, aspect uh, to the whole scenario relative to the Davidians and Mount Carmel, uh, because my generation goes way back uh, to my first involvement as with my family in 1944, when we became uh, Davidians accepted the Shepherd's Rod. At that time, it was referred to as the Shepherd's Rod. I left the Davidians in 1959 after the disappointment that Dr. Tabor referred to a few minutes ago of uh, the failed predictions uh, that uh, we felt were going to take place in the spring of 59. They didn't materialize. And uh, that terminated it for me. It was devastating to me. In fact, I explained quite a bit of this on the two hour video interview that uh, Dr. Tabor and also Dr. Arnold, Phil Arnold had a couple of years ago with me. And I think some of you may have, may have seen this, but it was devastating so that I really went undercover. I didn't want anyone to know that I had, had ever been uh, a Seventh-day Adventist, let alone a Davidian Seventh-day Adventist. And so I remained undercover for about 60 years, really, on this. But I felt now at my age, and I'll be 91 in a couple of months, about the time, uh, James, you retire, on the, you retire on my dad's birthday, July the 1st on that. Uh, but I felt like that I needed to step forward and uh, and be available to supply information as a still living source of information of what Mount Carmel was all about, what the Davidians were all about prior to 1959. 1959 was when David, David Koresh was born, and that's when I left. And... Uh, Prior to that, living at Mount Carmel, in old, at old Mount Carmel in 1944, and then uh, later New Mount Carmel, where all this happened in 93, um, I was very much involved with the Davidians and uh, involved with the work in Brother Hodiff. And uh, I have tremendous memories back then but I don't feel that I'm in a position to try to push anything particularly relative to Waco. I have told many people that I will make myself available 
as a source of information of what it was like before David Grace, before 93, before 1959, during that time frame. And I'm, uh, I'm more than willing to do that. I do have to applaud this. What you guys are doing, Dr. Tabor and Dr. Arnold and, uh, and Kathy and all of you, um, Rick, uh, uh, Dick Rivas and all of you, focusing on the truth of what really happened and how the Davidians were treated, not letting it die. I know amongst the Holocaust survivors that I've been working with the last 10 years in Israel and all, the theme is, don't forget it, you know, lest it happen again, keep it alive. And the same thing is, is true of the Davidians and what you guys are doing. So I thank you so much for continuing with it and God bless you in your efforts. And if there's any way that I can be of any uh, assistance, um, you know, contact me if I'm more than glad to do so. So, uh, and Dr. Thank Taylor and I are a real good friend. Maybe he'll tell you the story how we how we got together, how we met, and the whole scenario. Uh, he and I both referred to it as a as a total act of God, the way this came about as a as a as a miracle. And then he introduced me to Phil Arnold, and then on there. So, God bless let, you. Let me add, uh, Dudley. Let me add something. Uh, Dudley is a very modest man. Uh, he didn't just hang out or study with Victor Huff. He really became his, well, really, particularly Florence, after, even after Brother Huff died. He was true. He was the spokesman of the radio broadcast. You should hear his voice. You can hear it now. And Dudley, when I'm almost 91, please, God, can I be as articulate and handsome and wonderful as you are? Oh, you're so tired. I'm, I'm just a baby <laughs> compared to you. But anyway, Dudley's voice. Oh, it, you remember uh, Herbert Armstrong in the 40s and 50s, some of you on the radio, you know, just booming out across the whole country. Dudley had that same kind of a broadcast voice. That's what Dudley does. He's a broadcaster. And he also, uh, you know, was responsible for working with Florence on all the notes and he truly true was a key component and I do have a video on my YouTube channel that I don't know if you gave it to me Dudley I think I just got it somewhere yeah. on TV station of the 1959 disappointment and who's standing up at the pulpit or whatever you the podium speaking about it all but Dudley Goff you know uh, so he was truly a uh, a very key component of that period, a living voice. I'm going to put the link in the chat to his interview, and I would really recommend it was wonderfully professionally filmed, and he tells the whole story in great detail. I wanted to thank Dudley as well um, for... Uh, he gave us several videos. They were going to do a documentary. Uh, there was a gentleman named Pat Matriciano who was doing a documentary. And he we got a lot of interviews, myself, Jamie Casillo, uh, even Paul Fada, a very rare interview with Paul yeah. Fada, yeah. early, early, early on. And uh, he's, we've been given access to some of those videos, thanks to uh, Dudley. So again, Dudley, thank you very much for that. It's so appreciated. I have one question for Dudley before I move on, though. I was having a talk yesterday with um, with Sheila, Sheila Martin. And we were talking about the the different angels' messages. There was you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, up the way, all the way up to David Crush. We believe David Crush to have the seventh angel's message. Uh, that's fascinating to me. The succession that went on. So when you were studying with Howard, was that the third angel's message or the fourth angel's message, Dudley? It was still just the three angels' messages as Adventists, you know nothing really added to that per se the thing that was different is that we believed that bt hardeth was the antitypical elijah the prophet in fulfillment of malachi where he says that he would send elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the lord jesus referred to john the baptist as 
uh, Elijah also of his day preceding his first coming. We felt Brother Hodeth was the same at the second coming. And so it was also, he never claimed that himself. In none of his writings do you find him claiming to be Elijah the prophet, but we all believed that, that he was. Uh, likewise, we didn't talk about it, but we really believed that uh, Brother Hodeth would not die. And when he died in 55, that was, that was a real shocker. And out of that grew all of this a concentrated effort to reach Adventists for three and a half years after his death that would terminate in the spring of 59, at which time the church would be cleansed, the kingdom set up in Jerusalem, 144,000 would go there, and, all, and it didn't happen. And that, that was so devastating to me that I really then turned my back on Brother Hoffman being a prophet, a good man, I loved him, you know, sure. but he wasn't a prophet. Ellen G. White, a good lady, I loved her. My parents on my mom's side go all the way back before 1900 as Adventists, you know, but I couldn't accept her as a prophet anymore. And I basically, I just about gave up everything, but God- I'm losing you, Dudley. Pardon? Pardon? I can hear him okay. So. Dudley, I think we have a bad connection now. Oh, do we? Oh, I'll try again. Thank you, though, very much for hearing yeah. every other word. Yeah, and I'm not hearing you. I've seen your How about, Okay, I'm I'm hearing Dudley. Yeah, we can't things. hear you, my friend. But uh, I, uh, oh, uh, uh, Dave, oh, Dave, I think it's your end. I think everybody else is hearing Dudley just fine. Dave, I think it's your end. Yeah, I think you're right, Kathy. Oh, it might. Oh, be. By, by the way, Dudley uh, didn't. And tell you that you talk about taking prophecy literally, Kathy. Uh, Dudley's father was commissioned to build a stadium on the old property that would seat 144,000. I mean, these people are going to like book flights and come into Waco and then get cars and drive out and gather and sit in the stadium. So, this is called taking the Bible literally. And when David went to Israel, if you remember his story, he wanted to see whether 144,000 could fit on Mount Zion. Well, in Jerusalem, as you might know, wow. there are three Mount Zions. There's the Temple Mount, you know, where the Dome of the Rock is and all that. And then there's the City of David. But the Modern Mount Zion, and I think it's the ancient one, is the Southwest Hill, and that's where David went. I talked to some of the rabbis that knew him then when I was in Jerusalem, and guess what? It's the only spot in Jerusalem that isn't built with buildings and streets, and it would, it's two, three soccer fields, uh, two or three tennis courts, and the Greeks own it, and they just keep it there, and it's right at the top of Mount Zion. And it's a very similar kind of idea, like, yeah, my people could fit here. Because <laughs> if you've been to Jerusalem, it's like, you couldn't fit 144,000 anywhere in that city. Are you talking all these little alleys and streets? <laughs> but on Mount Zion, it, it, hey, it's still waiting if anybody wants to book a flight. But that's where we're excavating right now. UNC Charlotte is on Mount Zion. So there you go. Yeah, David, I would like to mention one other thing. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Better than ever now. Yeah. Um, um, but Dr. Tabor had asked me in that interview about my contact and involvement with Brother Hodeth and how I felt about it. And I can relate this to you and others of you at Mount Carmel there under David Koresh and listening to him and how captivated you were, not altogether because of what he said, but because of who you felt he was. And I had the same feeling with Brother Hodeth. I would sit there in the auditorium. He would then be speaking and Florence's wife would be in the front of the auditorium on the left side, taking notes shorthand of his message that would be uh, translated, uh, uh, transcribed, and put into the leaflets that we sent out every other week. And I would sit there and I was absolutely 
uh, I was immersed in in the feeling that I am sitting here listening to the prophet of God, to Elijah the prophet. And uh, I can't describe really the feeling, but I can re I can see the same thing that I felt toward Brother Harv as a teenager at that time. Uh, I can see this parallel to that with you guys, with David Koresh during those years, you know. And so uh, that adds a little more. Uh, Pull on your heartstrings. Yeah, it really does, you know, and also it raises the degree of the tragedy that was done to to the Davidians there in 93. I mean, how terrible to treat honest, God-fearing people uh, as, it, as it was done there. And actually, it's a harbinger of things to come. If going into the revelation, it's foretold of what's going to be happening to those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. It began there at Mount Carmel in 93, in my judgment. That was the beginning of it, the heavy handedness of a government that has no tolerance for anything they disagree with, and especially anything that is spiritual. So, you know, Dudley. I have to interrupt you because what you just said was so, it was so perfect and phenomenal. And when I was driving here this morning, I had no idea what I was going to say. We, I had no speakers, nobody that could show up today. And I wasn't sure if uh, James is going to be on or you were going to be, I didn't know who was going to be on the Zoom. So I'm like, what am I going to say for two hours? What's the theme of this? And I this kept coming back to me. It kept coming back to me. This, this one phrase and it's, you reap what you sow. Yeah. It was just, that's, I just kept hearing you reap what you sow. And I think about Ukraine. I think about Russia and what's happening now. I think about this country. I think about the incredibly bloody history of the world in this country. And when I think of Mount Carmel, I think, you know, the government thinks they get, they, they get away with this. They think because they, to an extent, through the corporations control the media, right? And they basically journalists shill for the corporations that they're always going to be able to control us then uh, there's the internet and there's podcasts there's other ways of thought that we have access to that we've never had in the history of mankind before and you know what at the end of the day they're not going to get away with it no they, you you do reap what you sow and if we're not careful we're, we're heading down a dangerous path here as as, as, as a people um you know the other thing to this is I said last year, and, and I want to try to make this point over and over again, to anyone that may watch this or hear this, any of the ATF guys or the FBI guys, I know many of them have retired now and some of them are coming forward with their stories. Um, I hope that your consciousness weighs heavy on you. And if you are someone that was in a position to know things that maybe some of the other agents did, didn't know, it's time to unburden your soul and come forward with that information. I would like someone to confirm that there was a that there was a shooting going on at the back of the building next to the tanks as we have on the infrared. I'd like someone on that side to basically say, yeah, that wasn't sunlight reflections. That was fully automatic weapons fire. And uh, there was firing into the building. Somebody before maybe you just found Jesus or you just found God or you, you are maybe laying on your deathbed you want to unburden your soul well, guess what now's the time to do it let's i want someone to come forward from that side and, and let the world know what really happened yeah. that's that's my wish that's how i would like to end this documentary of that mankind for us so thank you very much dudley james everyone is there anyone let's see how much time we got it's eleven seventeen. so I got maybe time for one more, and then I want to read some of the names of the people that have died that aren't including in the presentation. I'd like to get that done before we do the presentation. So, Dana, Jenny, um, yes? Dana, hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hey, Dana. Um, I couldn't sleep very well last night. I was remembering my friends, the ones from Hawaii that I knew from Diamond Head Church. 
Why don't you tell everyone who you are, Dana? Oh, what? Introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Dana Kiabu, um, formerly Dana Okimoto. I was one of David's wives, and I have two children who are now grown and doing very well. Um, yeah, and I left the group about a year before it hit the news. Um, but I've done my best to maintain contact with people through the years as I could, um, particularly with uh, people who like Robin Buns, who has also has a son. I wanted our, ch our kids to know each other and they do. We've been visiting over the years back and forth when they were young. Um, and Sky has also contacted David's other daughter who wasn't part of our group, but Linda's daughter, who he always talked about Linda, his first love. Um, so Sky and Shay are friends and it's, it's, it's just been wonderful to keep the connections going. But I've been thinking about the people and as you started out, you were talking about the people. And I wrote a little bit about each of the ones from Hawaii um, in a journal, actually. Um, and I would like to share a little bit of that with you, if you don't mind. That'd be wonderful. Okay. So I'm going to start with Jeff, because Jeff was my best friend. People thought we were dating. We were not. Is that David Jeff Little? Thought, huh? Uh, please include the last name so we know exactly who you're referring yeah. to. Jeff Little, six foot three, flaming red hair. Jeff, Jeffrey, not Jeffrey Little. He used to always say, I'm Jeffrey, not Jeffrey. I miss your laughter. Your humorous ways remain in my heart always. Forever humorous and hilarious. James Tom called you trench mouth when you smiled. I miss you the most. Sherry, meaning Sherry Jewel. You would be so proud of Kiri. Actually, I believe you are. She is so much like you and a dedicated mother like you. I am so blessed to have her back in my life and to watch her family and her energy for life continue growing. Did you pick Raphael, her husband, for her? For Steve and Judy Schneider. I still feel the heartbreak that came with the new light. Even Mayana, Judy's daughter, who gave the gift of motherhood to Judy and was one of her greatest joys, was also the confirmation that Judy and Steve were a couple in this life no more. You remained a team until the end, trying to be loyal to each other and God. My heart aches for you still. You two shared a remarkable love story. Sonnets could be written. Hmm. <laughs> Neil and Margarita Vega, baptized and married on the same day. I promise to tell that story for Joanne, their daughter. The mighty man whose philosophy was, it is what it is, man. The former high society girl turned baker teaching us how to add love into our cooking. Margarita visited Andre Calais, who was another guy uh, who never came to Waco. He's, he watched the property in Palestine. Regularly when he was hospitalized with what, with what was then called AIDS related complex. She drove more than two hours each way from Mount Carmel to Palestine to see him. I wonder if she was the one who helped him put his beloved Neba Kitty down. Such a compassionate heart. Scott and Sita Sonobe, another mighty man and a hungry one that might at that. Mark wrote a song for you. It was called Hungry. I'm not gonna sing it. <laughs> Please won't you help me? Won't you do something good? Please won't you help me and give me a little food because it's been three hours, three long hours, 
And if I don't get something soon, I'm gonna die. And if I sang better, I would sing it someday. Sita, Sita was pregnant when she arrived at Palestine or maybe became pregnant there. Either way, Angelica was born at a nearby hospital. With, when her time came, the guys resort, <laughs> the guys insisted on carrying her up the path. And this is in the woods in Palestine. She would probably have preferred to walk, but it was their first and Scott may have been a little overexcited. Mark and Jadine Wendell, a mighty man and his former policewoman. Yet another wonderful yet sad love story. Tamara, born in a hotel in Palestine, delivered by a lay midwife. Mark, the ever dutiful husband. Janessa at two or three and me in attendance. Janessa and I watched as her father helped her mother bring her sister into the world. The midwife called to her, come on, sweet pea, come on. And she came gently into Jadine's arms. It was a beautiful moment. I saw Jay sometime, one last time, after I returned home to Hawaii. She had come for her father's funeral, and we met at Windward Mall and had dinner, and then sat talking in the parking lot until about 1.30. The security guard came and knocked on the window and said, you guys got to get out of here. We're going to lock the gate. I told her why I had left, because I had no longer believed the message. Her response was, you have no fear, do you? To you. And I said, no, his power came from my belief. When that was gone, I spent a long time trying to get it back. I, wait, I waited till Judy's baby was born, but nothing happened. No rush of pure joy at another of God's children being born. But I said nothing at the time because that would be speaking leasing. You know, I would get in trouble if I spoke my doubts. I waited on the Lord. I tried to fall on the rock, but my faith was already broken. When Sky broke his arm and I got yelled at for talking to him in the hospital, for taking him to the hospital, that was the last straw. I told her about how Sky had broken his arm while physically, literally horsing around with Karen, Clive's daughter playing horsey. After we had gotten home from the LA County General ER, all I got was a verbal thrashing. I spent a long night sitting in the kitchen. I told her, if I stay, we die, you know that. She told me that when she returned to California, she and Mark and family were returning to Mount Carmel. They had left the message because they couldn't stand not living as husband and wife but they had decided after a short while that they could not turn their backs on the truth. They did return. Janessa, Tamara, Landon and Patron were sent out of the compound early in the siege, most likely because Jadine had died during the initial raid on February 28th. Rest in peace, my friends, in the assurance that you are not forgotten. You are written in my book. I just wanted that, to share that. That was fun, just fantastic. I'm so glad that you shared all that, Dana. Thank you so much. And um, that, that was absolutely amazing. It, it just, it took this to a whole other level and depth for me. Um, you got to touch on, on many of the people that I know that, that you knew first. And, you know, with, with just the amount of people, it, it's, it's, it, it's, we recognize everyone in the memorials, we have the slideshow presentation, but there are details to these individuals. Um, I learned a lot from Sheila Martin's book and talking about a lot of the people in there. I learned a lot from Clive's book, talking about some of the people that, you know, um, I just came in for a year, but Clive, Sheila, they, they knew these people for so much longer. And some of those details are just so um, deep, impressive, phenomenal all these different um, adjectives, a few of these incredible people. And, you know, I'm still learning about this all these, all these years later, I'm still learning about uh, the people that are passed on. And so, uh, wow, that was, 
Yeah, I'm going to be thinking about I'm going to think about that for a long time, Dana. Thank you so much. And and uh, next year for sure, I'd love to have you back and talk about some more of the of the people. Thank you. That's phenomenal. Um, we're going to get to some names here pretty soon. I want to just thank everyone for being here um, and the survivors who are here in house today, and those who aren't, those who are, are uh, here via Zoom. Um, I don't think we're going to have any speakers, so I, I'm just I'm. I'm, I'm happily I'm happily surprised how this turned out. Thank you, James. Did you have a, a comment? Yeah, I wanted to recognize and thank Dick Revis, uh, who's with us. Uh, he was such, and Kathy is modest and just sat down and talked about her internet, but what Kathy and Dick have done, and, and of course, Phil Arnold isn't here, looks like, but he's involved in some Ukrainian things. He's trying to really help with the Ukrainian church over there taking the side of Putin. And he's trying to work on some, some things. Uh, but Dick, Dick's work and his initial book, Ashes of Waco, and also uh, Stuart already spoke, but it's, it is wonderful how we bonded together for almost 30 years now. Uh, you know, this group of academics and stuck with you guys and learned to love you so much. So, Does Dick have any, do you have anything you'd like to say, Dick? I didn't want to put him on the spot, but I just want people to know what a help he was to me. Yeah. Well, I, I still keep an eye, not close like the rest of you, on pe what people think of Mount Carmel. And I think we've won the argument, meaning the day it burned down, most Americans were cheering. Now most of them know that it was a massacre, that the government negligently and maybe maliciously carried out. We've won the argument there. The problem that I've seen over the years, and it may be improving now, is that those people who defended the Davidian, Davidians <clears throat> were mainly Second Amendment people. They saw it as a political conflict. Whereas my understanding would be that David's followers saw it as a religious con conflict and that what was important to them was not so much that the Second Amendment survived as that their beliefs did. And on that grounds, I've, how do you say, it seems to be, we seem to be, how do you say, the Davidians seem to be losing strength. Um, I took their religion as the serious part of their life it was not for them a part of an American political debate that comes and goes, the Second Amendment. Um, and I think years from now, there probably won't be a Second Amendment, but Waco will still stand out as an example of government misbehavior, and it will be seen as religiously intolerant. I guess that, oh, I have a question. Uh, I'm, Clive and Sheila must be around, but I don't see them on the screen. Are they in bad health or what's going That's on? That's because they're in house. They're, they're, they're here in the, the audience, Dick. That's why, and there's, oh, that's because right. of the Zoom thing, we don't really have, yeah. Want to say hello to them. Uh, Sheila says hello. And hello. Clive says hello too in his own way. <laughs> she wants you come here and sit down and let everyone see you okay she doesn't want okay all right no problem dick what a great point uh that was that's fantastic that it wasn't it was turned into a political thing and you know that 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 was part of my frustration coming out it's um i had the story and i what i saw from being there wasn't what was being reported. 
And I figure, well, people will at least listen to me. But it wasn't the left. It wasn't the people that I thought it wasn't the NPR group. It wasn't the intellectual OCOs. It wasn't any of that. It was the people that wanted to hear what I had to say were those that were on the right, the constitutional groups. Uh, militias were forming because of Waco. People were just so upset with the death of so many people who are studying the scripture um, that people that get that and study scripture uh, wanted to protect themselves against their own government. And so they started forming. Um, gun groups, these are the people that wanted, the only people that would even listen to me early on. So that's why I wrote a book. I wrote the book out of frustration. I wrote the book because the people that died did not deserve the amount of demonization that they got. Um, I'm, I'm glad I did now. Um, that just, you so well expressed that point that it wasn't a political thing. Everybody saw it differently depending on where you were. And that's, uh, what, that's an excellent point, Dick. Thank you so much for that. So let's see, we're, um, it is 11.34. I'm gonna read some names now of some of the people that have died since. And then we're gonna do the slideshow presentation of those that, that were at Mount Carmel on April 19th. Um, did you have anything else to say, Dick, before I move on? Uh, first, that my book is still in print. And secondly, when you think about it, the Davidians didn't die because they, they wanted to save the Second Amendment. They died because they questioned the whole secularization of life. And how do you say, it? they were Christians who changed their lives because of what they believed. Unlike the shopping, you know, the Christian who goes to the shopping mall on Sunday or whatever. Um, they were trying, they were questioning everything in our society not just the Second Amendment. Fantastic. I'm so glad that point was made today. Thank you so much. Um, Dick Revis' book, by the way, is Ashes of Waco. It was one of the first books that was published on Waco. Um, very extensive, incredible information in there. And I highly recommend people read that book. James Tabor's book is Why Waco? Um, is it still in print? Yes, it is actually. UC Berkeley apparently keeps them in print forever. So, Dick, thanks for that uh, very, very, very insightful comment. Um, I feel the same way. It's great to have the crazy people, I shouldn't say that in quotes, that gather over the years at these things. By that, I just mean, you know, divided into political groups and so forth. But um, there's a core that was touched by the humanity of it all. And also the message, whether it's acceptable as truth or not, but just the way Dudley described his belief and others of us. And that's what we have tried to uh, be a part of. I've got to go to class. If I, if you're still going strong after my class, I'm going to come back and hang out with you. So, uh, James, before you go, I do want to mention that I thoroughly and enjoyed and endorsed your book as well as Dick Reeves. I read them okay. a long time ago. They're fantastic. And, and they tell the truth of what, it, of what this is all about. So Thank you, Dudley. Good to see you all. Take care. Lots of love to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, James. Hey, David. Right, first I of all, I guess some... Hey, David, yep. can I say something? Um, yes. Yeah, University of Chicago is still sending me royalties from my book that I published in 1995, Armageddon in Waco. Um, and that's, that's, that's extraordinary that the book would yield 27 years. I mean, the royalties are, are a pittance, but I'm, the fact that it's still being published and still being purchased and uh, most of, uh, uh, when I look at the statements, most of um, the purchases are, are coming from abroad. So it's an international message now. It's not just in the United States. 
Yeah, Chicago is really good on that, these university presses. I'm so glad yours is still being uh, printed, Dick. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, all the books that are still out there, just that, that to me, they're just so important. And um, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that you guys have done all the work that you have over the years and that people are still reading. <laughs> people are still reading your works and uh, hopefully that, that'll continue. We know next year there's a lot of things in the works. Um, uh, Jeff Gwynn has a book that will be coming out about Waco. There's a Netflix documentary that's going to be coming out. Um, boy, that's supposed to be very extensive as well. Um, there is a second season of the Waco drama. The, the six-part series are doing another six-part series that'll be out. And I guess that's going to focus on pre-David uh, um, meeting the group uh, under Vernon, be, Vernon studying with Lois. It's going to flash back to the early days and him taking over the group and flash forward to the trials and some of the things that happened at the um, civil case and the uh, mostly the, the criminal case. Um, I have no involvement in this whatsoever, and I have no idea what's going on with it other than that little bit of information. But three, there's three major things coming out for the 30th Memorial, which is next year. So next year should be interesting. Um, so I'd like to get on before I run out of time here, and I wanna, there's some people I'd like to mention I'd like to thank the Taylor Museum of Waco for allowing us to do this every year. We missed the last couple of years because of COVID, still Zoomed, but we are here today at the Taylor Museum of Waco History. And uh, really, we couldn't have done this uh, without Kathy Wessinger and all the incredible work she's done. She came here, she had her husband drive her here and helped us set everything up. And through the university, we have to do the Zoom and all the, uh, the technological things that needed to be done. We've been uh, working together for the last couple of days to make sure that this would go smoothly and it's gone fairly smoothly. But um, Kathy Westinger has many uh, just amazing writings about um, religious groups, um, histories. I highly recommend anything by her you should definitely read. And I thanks so much for every year, uh, Kathy. You just, uh, it's amazing how you, how you help us. So appreciate it, really do. Um, I also want to mention uh, Matt Whitmer, who originally put together the slideshow presentation of, of our friends that were lost in Waco. Uh, we're going to be showing later. Thank you so much, Matt, for all your hard work. And I'll tell you how much over the years we appreciate everything you've done. And you know, just, just thank you. Now, I know, listen, I know there's, there's a lot of people that have helped us and I'm not going to remember everyone, though, though I have tried. For, so for those who I am forgetting, I apologize in advance. Let me know, and I'll make sure to include you next year. Um, I want to talk about some of the people that have died since Waco who maybe necessarily, well, that didn't die during the siege uh, on February 28th or on April 19th. But these are people that were survivors or people that were important to the survivors, people that have helped out throughout the years. Um, Helen Marie Taylor. Uh, the woman who ran this very museum that we're in, she, she died last year. And we are very indebted to her for allowing all these years for us to come here to the museum and, and, and hold us here. So um, yeah, I guess I ring a bell for all the people. I'm going to ring a bell for these names as well. So um, thank you, Helen Reed. May you rest in peace. This next name is a very interesting story. There's, there was a gentleman named uh, Steve Kreider Benjamin who uh, had come here to, to Waco and he wanted to, um, well, he believed that he was to take over Mount Carmel. Uh, he believed that he, um, that God had wanted him to do that and to challenge the gentleman that's out there now, Charlie Pace directly. Uh, Steve got to know a lot of us. Steve became a friend of ours. Uh, he died in 2021 of COVID. So we want to remember Steve Kreider Benjamin. Uh, another name here, and Clive and I got together yesterday and tried to come up with as many names as we could possibly remember. I'm sure 
that I've forgotten someone again. I apologize for that. Uh, Daniel Castillo, we want to recognize. One of the survivors who went to jail um, was Kevin Whitecliffe. Kevin Whitecliffe died in 2018. If um, just give a little background on Kevin. Kevin had come to the group and was studying there, um, you know, during before, obviously before the the, uh, the siege took place. On the day of February 28th, when the BATF attacked, after the ceasefire was established, I went out into the cafeteria area, and I, I will never forget the look on Kevin's face. He he walked in. He was at the back of the building. He walked into the cafeteria and he was shaking and he was angry. And I said, that was crazy. You know, that David went to the front door and then all these shots just started. And, you know, we just start, started here. It's like all that happened at the front door, the, the first shots. And Kevin corrected me, he said, no, the hell firing first. And I said, to me, it sounded like, you know, it was at the front door. He goes, I was outside. I saw them come in firing. And he said, when he said he was very angry, he was like shaking and yelling. No, the helicopters fired first. In other words, this isn't a person that's making this up. This is the adrenaline was pumping. He was relaying to me exactly what he saw outside in the back of the building. And that was the helicopters came in and there, there were, there were, there must have been agents on the, on the helicopter shooting into the building. So I never forgot that. I never forgot the passion in which he was telling me his story. So I never doubted in my mind ever that the helicopters came into the building and the helicopters were shooting, that there were people shooting from the helicopters that day. That's important because, you know, uh, the military, the law enforcement is never supposed to use military equipment against American citizens. They get away with that under the Posse Comitatus Act with the war on drugs. If there's a drug nexus, then they can use military equipment. That's kind of like a chink in the law there. And that's why the ATF said that there was meth being manufactured in Mount Carmel. There wasn't, and I believe they knew that. It's the only way that they could get the helicopters that they wanted to use, as they just, so they say, as a distraction in the back. So anyway... Um, Kevin died in 2018, and I just, uh, I, I appreciate him as a survivor and what he had to go through in the prison system until he was finally released so, to Kevin Whitecliffe. Catherine Madison was another one of the survivors. Catherine came out during the siege. Uh, boy, she was a firebrand, wasn't she? For anyone who knew Catherine, it's very, very outspoken. Um, and just, uh, I don't know, she, she got things done. You know, Catherine was, uh, was one of a kind, uh, Catherine died in 2009. She made it to 2009. So, um, Catherine Madison. I wanted to recognize, um, well, Sheila's son, Jamie Martin. Jamie had come out during the siege with Sheila. Uh, you know, Jamie was a handicapped child and uh, needed special care, which um, Sheila provided for him his entire life. Very special individual. Um, Jamie was one of the miracles that I think brought Wayne to an understanding of, of the scripture and an understanding of the message. and. Uh, Wayne Martin, his, his father. So uh, Jamie died in 1998. I'd like to, I'd like to recognize Wyla Lucas. Wyla was someone who came in um, when uh, she was there when they were rebuilding the, the chapel back in 2000. She had befriended a bunch of us. She had many videos that she had done, all of which... Um, um, when she died, were handed over to Mike Hansen. So there's a lot of history that Wy that Wylo is responsible for recording, and uh, we have that because of her. I personally spent time with her and her family in uh, Henderson, Nevada. Um, they helped me a great deal. They helped the survivors a great deal. They're very special individuals. Her entire family. So Wylo Lucas died in 2017. We'd like to recognize her. 
I'm not sure the dates. Some dates I have, some I don't. I apologize for that. But her husband, Larry Lucas, died recently as well. Um, a very good friend. So we'd like to uh, recognize Larry Lucas. In 2019, right before the COVID thing hit, we had a memorial here. And um, I think just days before the memorial, Clive's eldest daughter, Karen Doyle Graham, was killed by a drunk driver. So she didn't make it to that memorial. And Karen, you know, had been a part of the group as um, uh, most of her, her life, I believe. Um, so the daughter of Clive Doyle, Karen Doyle Graham died in 2019. Next name is a name that's um, very dear to my heart, Mary Bell Jones. Mary Bell was the, well, was the um, kind of the, the matriarch of the Jones family. She had uh, David Jones, uh, Rachel Jones, who was David Crush's first wife, Michelle Jones. Uh, she had other children who had left the group and they came of age. Um, Mary Bell Jones and I were very close um, and I miss her very much. She died in 2014. Another supporter that went to just about every memorial that I can remember and was very kind of active in the Facebook groups is Mary Winborn. It was uh, two or three years ago, Mary Winborn died. I apologize that I do not have the year that she died. I will get that for next year. But we wanted to recognize Mary Winborn. Um, Clive mentioned a name that I am not familiar with, but a friend of the Davidians, a friend of the survivors, uh, Edith Kaprosi. Edith Kaprosi? Mm -hmm. And we don't have the year that she died, but she passed too, and we'd like to recognize her. And of course, in 2015, um, we lost someone who was just very important. Um, he did a lot of the research, um, most of the research for the uh, original documentary, Waco, The Rules of Engagement. He's the guy that basically went into the evidence room and found in Austin and found that the government had um, pyrotechnic devices that were, re or that were mismatches, silencers, they were called. Um, he found and got access to the infrared video and did that documentary, uh, The Rules of Engagement was nominated for an Oscar, Mike McNulty. Mike McNulty has done so much work to help bring the truth out. It's, I can't overstate it. And, you know, I, um, I just wish, um, may he rest in peace and, we thank him for all his work. Mike McNulty died in 2015. Boy, another person that was very important to us during the siege, um, Ron Engelman. I'm afraid I do not have the year that Ron Engelman passed away. Ron Engelman had a radio show. It was a national radio show. Ron Engelman had a national radio show that... Um, we were listening to during the siege as the siege was wearing on day in, day out. Ron Engelman was the only voice of sanity as far as I could tell. And he was basically speaking to Second Amendment rights, um, the separation of church and state. And he was talking about all these things that we were experiencing firsthand. And the reason why people should learn from their history, they should understand their constitution and um, you know defend themselves against tyranny and that that was his day in and day out that was his message and there was a period of time during the siege that he um he said if you're listening move one of the satellite dishes which we did so at that point he understood that we were listening to his show and i think that's how we met Tabor and arnold Tabor and arnold went on his show knowing that we were listening and we're able to come up with a plan for David to write out the seven seal manuscript, make a deal with the FBI that once Tabor and Arnold received the seven seal manuscript, we would come out and um, seven seals would exist 
and, and be out there and be disseminated to some of the theologians who could hopefully have debates with David in the future about it. And that, that wasn't allowed to happen. David Krish finished the first seal on, on, on April 17th. And it was April 19th that they came in with the CS gas plan. He was starting the second seal and wasn't allowed to complete it. So, you know, when the whole world hates you and the government's out there and there's tanks driving around your building, destroying your property and helicopters are buzzing the house, to have a voice of reason that understands or at least is protesting what is happening to you. It seemed like the only voice that was protesting what was happening to us. I can't tell you that he gave us such hope and it was so meaningful to have that person out there. That was Ron Engelman. Ron Engelman passed away many years ago. I do not have the date. I will get it for next year. I apologize, but we definitely want to recognize Ron Engelman and all his great work that he did for us on our behalf. I'd like to recognize Pat Matriciano. I mentioned him earlier. He's with a company called Jeremiah Films. And he did many early interviews with many of the survivors that the documentary never got made. But through Deadly, he's passed off many of those interviews to us that can be used in, in a future documentary that a gentleman who was supposed to speak here today, Ryan Azevedo, was working on with us. Uh, Ryan has the flu and couldn't make it today. So we're very, um, you know, we hope that he gets well. And we want to recognize Pat Matriciano for his work with uh, Jeremiah Films all those years ago, even though it never came out. Pat, thank you. In 2020, we lost a supporter named Gray McCamps in the year 2020, and we appreciate him. Richard Mosley was another individual that was an early uh, supporter that we, um, that we had dealings with. Richard Mosley died in 2017. Let's not forget Dewey Malay. He was a person that uh, came to all the memorials and was close with I know Clive and, and myself. We all um, were very friendly with Dewey. Uh, Dewey died in 2009. And uh, these are really in no order. Uh, there was a Gene Smith from Australia who passed away. I don't have that year, I apologize. Uh, but we'd like to recognize Gene Smith. And then the last person that I have here on the list, we want to recognize, of course, Edna Doyle, uh, Clive's wonderful mother, who was she was another force to be reckoned with, wasn't she, Clive? Um, boy, she was. Uh, she just helped with everything. She helped with the children. She was a true force, a great woman, greatly missed. Edna died in 2001. Also, we want to recognize, of course, David Crusher's mother, Bonnie Haldeman. Bonnie was, was killed by her sister who had um, schizophrenia. And uh, that, that was a, you know, that was quite a loss to us in the series. Um, Bonnie is, was represented. Uh, they cut out a lot of the stuff with Bonnie, but Bonnie was very important to the story, very important to uh, what my mother went through when she came here in Waco during the siege. They got to know each other and befriended each other. And, uh, you know, she was, um, Bonnie was always there. She was, uh, she lived outside of Mount Carmel. She didn't live on the property, but she always came through. Um, she did for a time, David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. She, did. she got a. She wrote a. Um, she has a book out, right? Yes. She died in two thousand nine. What was the name of her book? Yeah, Memories of the Branch of Indians. That's it. I learned so. Yeah, Memories of the Branch of Indians. I learned so much about people that I knew, but you know, didn't really know. These like to me, I was only there a year, so many acquaintances. She really told their stories, I thought, quite well. I thought that book was just a real eye-opener for me. And so we miss Bonnie very much. And this one is for Bonnie. Rest in peace. David, may I mention one other person? Yes, please do. 
Yeah, I was sad to, to hear that um, this past summer, uh, Grace Adams passed away in New Zealand. Uh, Grace's sister, Rebecca uh, Sataia, died or was killed in the fire on April 19th. And I heard from uh, the family, yes, yeah, she passed away of a short illness um, in July. 2021? Uh, no, just this past, uh, yeah, 2021, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks. Like I said, I, I know there's people that we're going to forget. Um, yeah. we'll, have, we'll try to have an updated list for next year. Thank you for, um, for, for mentioning that. We really appreciate it. All right, we're going to read um, the first name. These are the people who died on either February 28th or on April 19th, 1993. Winston Blake, British, his age is 28 and died on February 28th, 1993. Um, he was engaged to Beverly Elliott, was killed on April 19th as well. I, the belief is he was shot from the helicopter, fired into his room. Um, I personally saw uh, the bullet holes in the, um, there was a, a water tank in front of his window and you could see where the bullet hole went into the side of, of the tank in one side and then came out the other side. Um, when I later, when his body was cleared from the room, I, I got down, I actually peered through the hole and I could see that, that the bullet was fired from the air. So, um, Winston Blake, I, I believe as to most of the people I think that were there that he was shot and killed from one of the helicopters. He was buried during the siege in the storm shelter. Um, the, the one that was uh, underground. So that's where a lot of the people were buried. Uh, Winston Blake. The next name is Peter Gent. He's Australian. 24 years of age when he died on February 28th, 1993. Peter was the individual was on top of the water tower. Um, he was likely killed from a helicopter. Our belief is that he was killed from one of the helicopters and probably one of the first people shot. He had a twin sister, Nicole Gent. Uh, she was killed on April 19th. Peter was uh, very close with Greg Summers, Greg buried him. He was the only person to be buried in front of the building across the driveway during the siege. And after Greg buried Peter in the front, he also lined the dogs up. So from a couple miles away, uh, the media could still see the bodies of the dogs. We wanted it to be aware that the first things, um, we believe the dogs were some of the first things, some of the first shots were fired at the dogs. Um, Peter, Peter Gent, um, we remember you today and rest in peace. Peter J. Hipsman, he was a, an American, age 28, died on February 28, 1993, on the first day during the initial BATF attack. He was uh, shot as well. He was from Hawaii. He was, a shot above, he was shot above the gym on the dog run, which was um, that, that just led over, over the gym. There was a dog run that went to the second story to where uh, David Koresh's room and office were. He was buried during the siege in the storm shelter. Remember Perry D. Jones. Um, Perry was the the uh, the father of, of Rachel and uh, Michelle. Um, Perry was American. He was age sixty four. Died on February twenty eighth, nineteen ninety three, during the BATF attack. Uh, Perry was at the front door. He held his um, when David Crush was holding his hand out, saying, "Hold on, there's women and children here." Perry was one of the first people to go down. Everyone that was at the front said he was, he went down screaming and that's when some of the people at the front door started shooting back in defense. Shot near the front door along with David, father of Rachel, Rachel Howell Crash, David Jones and Michelle Jones, Thibodeau who were killed on April 19th. He's buried as well during the siege of the storm shelter.
Michael Schroeder, American, age 29. He died uh, on February 20th, 1993. Uh, Scott mentioned him earlier. He was trying to get back into the building. He was at the mag bag when the raid occurred. He was trying to get back in and was shot by BATF agents outside. Um, according to the reports, and uh, it was execution style. He was executed, trying to sneak back into the building to get to his family. He was from Florida. At the, it says killed behind the property, shot by 17 agents, father of one son and three stepchildren, and wife to Kathy, who exited Mount Carmel during the siege. Jadine Wendell, American, age 34, died on the first day, February 28, 1993. Uh, Jadine was from uh, Hawaii. Uh, Dana mentioned her early in her earlier. Mother of four children, all sent out during the siege. She, sat on the, she was shot in her second floor bedroom and also buried during the siege in the storm shelter below. Four of the ATF agents died that day, and we will, we're going to recognize them as well. Conway LeBlu, American, ATF agent 830, died on February 28, 1993. Todd McKeon, American, ATF agent, age 28, also died February 28, 1993. Robert Williams, American, ATF agent, age 26, died on February 28th, 1993. Steve Willis, American ATF agent, age 32, died February 28th, 1993. Kathy Andrade, American, she was age 24, died on April 19th, 1993 during the conflagration. Argentinian background, um, her baby Chanel and sister, Jennifer, were also killed on April 19th. Uh, Kathy was really uh, uh, just an incredible, incredible person. I think Kathy had a better understanding of the message than, than, than most of us. She, in the studies, always asked some of the deeper questions. I always was looking forward when she would raise her hand because I knew we were going somewhere. She really just uh, took things to a, to a different level. I'm just an incredible person. I miss her very much. So acknowledge Kathy Andrade. Chanel Andrade, uh, American age one. Mother, uh, Kathy, of course, is her mother, um, died on April 19th, 1993. Jennifer Andrade, uh, Kathy's sister, was also in the group and in the building. American, uh, Jennifer was age 19, died on April 19th, 1993. Her sister was killed on the April 19th. She once bought a suitcase full of Disney movies to Mount Carmel. When she first came, she wanted to make sure that everyone had some wholesome entertainment. So she brought every Disney movie in her collection. And a lot of people thought that was, that was quite charming, beautiful, and just um, kind of explains the, the kind of person that she was. Ulrich George Bennett, British nationality. He was age 35. He died on April 19th, 1993. Um, Ulrich helped supervise some of the construction of Mount Carmel. People called him Rick, he went by Rick. Uh, Rick, I remember him basically 
laying the foundation. He had an engineering background. He laid the foundation of the building that you saw. Originally, the building was just um, the chapel, a hallway, and then the cafeteria area. And then when we started building onto it, everything was built back. We built the gym. That was uh, Rick was and had a hand in, in every step of the construction of the building. Uh, Susan Benta, uh, British, age 31, died on April 19th, 1993, of Jamaican descent. Mary Jean Borscht, American, age 49, died on April 19th, 93. She heard David speak in Northern California with Trudy Meyer and Ophelia Centoyo. She joined uh, David's group in Palestine, Texas in that, during that era, uh, back when they were first kicked off Mount Carmel by George Roden before they got to, to get back onto the property. They lived in the woods in Palestine, Texas, in buses and tents. Her son, Brad, later became a, a policeman in Colorado. He was doing quite well from what I understand. My good friend, Pablo Cohen, he was Israeli. David met him the first trip that he went over to uh, Israel, I believe, and uh, befriended him. He was age 38, died April 19th, 1993. He became David's uh, bass player and spent uh, much, we spent much time jamming and playing together. Uh, very boisterous individual. They always talked about a place in Israel called the Prophet's Pub. And the saying of the Prophet's Pub was the end is near, so have a beer at the Prophet's Pub. And I guess that's where he liked to hang out quite a bit. He's quite an individual. He's from Argentina, met David in Israel and was given a bass guitar. That's right, he, uh, I think his bass guitar was stolen and David bought him a bass to help him out. Um, Pablo, a uh, uh, very, very dear friend, I miss him very much. Um, he really kind of knew how to light up a room, that, that guy. He's very Miss Pablo Cohen. Abby Diwallo Davies. Um, we called them Dabo. British, age 30. Died in the fire April 19th, 1993. He was from Nigeria. Dabo Davies, we call them. Sherry E. Doyle, Clive's daughter, American, age 18. Also died on April 19th, 1993 in the conflagration. Clive's youngest daughter. She spent uh, much of the siege in the chapel with Clive and Marjorie Thomas. Beverly Elliott, British, age 30, died on April 19th, 1993. Engaged to Winston Blake, who was killed on the first day, February 28th. Doris Fagan, Livingston Fagan's mother, British, age 60, um, was there to the end, died on April 19th, 1993. Uh, son, her son Livingston was the last one negotiated out of the residence during the siege. Yvette Fagan, British, 32, uh, died on April 19th, 1993, was the mother of two children sent out during the siege. Mother-in-law, Doris, was killed on April 19th, and husband Livingston was uh, the last one to negotiate negotiated out of the re residence. Lisa Marie Ferris, American age 24, uh, also died April 19th, 1993. Met David in a music store in California. Uh, she was a uh, rock and roller all the way. She was, she was met David in Hollywood. 
What was that, Clyde? She, she worked in one of the music stores that David went to buy equipment in. And uh, she's kind of a girl after my own heart. We, talk, we liked a lot of the same bands and, you know, the 80s metal thing, the hair thing was fun. We used to talk about music coming out and some of the new stuff that was coming out all the time. She's a, uh, an amazing person, Lisa Ferris. Raymond Friesen, Canadian, age 76, when he died on April 19th, 1993. Previous Mennonite married to Tilly Friesen. Both became Branch Davidians from the uh, Mennonite faith. Raymond was one of several people who came in the chapel uh, area April 19th when the fire started. He was in the back section or with us for the people who got out, got out a little hallway between um, the chapel and the gymnasium area. And um, Raymond was back there, but he, he, he didn't make it up. Raymond Friesen. Sandra Hardile, British. Hardial. Sandra Hardial, thank you, Clark. British, age 27. Died on April 19th, 1993. She was of Jamaican descent. The Henry family we're about to talk about now. Uh, Zilla Henry, British, age 55. Died on April 19th, 1993. She brought her five young adult children to Mount Carmel in 1992. All perished on April 19th. Diana Henry, British, age 28, died on April 19, 93. Her mother was Zilla Henry and four siblings were also killed on April 19th. Diana Henry. Stephen Henry, British, age 26, died on April 19, 1993. His mother was Zilla. And her, his four siblings were also killed on 19, uh, on April 19th, excuse me, Stephen Henry. Paulina Henry, British, age 24, died on April 19th, 1993. Mother Zilla Henry and four siblings were also killed on April 19th. Philip Henry, British, age 22, died on April 19th, 1993. Mother Zilla Henry and four siblings was also killed on April 19th. He was, um, he was, uh, you know, one, one of one of, uh, one of Zilla's sons. Vanessa Henry, age 19, died on April 19th, 1993. Her mother, Zilla Henry, and four siblings were also killed on April 19th. Novelette Sinclair Hipsman, Canadian, age 36, uh, died on April 19th, 1993. She was from Montreal and spoke uh, fluent French. Met Clive Doyle in 1981 in Canada and studied with Lois Roden. She's friends and work cleaning job, Bonnie Haldeman, uh, David Christian Novelette. Floyd Howman. Floyd. American, age 61. He died on April 19th as well, 1993. Came from New Bedford, Massachusetts, with two busloads of people. Friends with Stan Silva. They were always together, always talking, very close. One of the people who came into the chapel on April 19th after the fire had started. Sh 
Cherry Jewel, American, age 43, died on April 19th, 1993. This is one of the individuals that Dana spoke of earlier. She's from Hawaii, was a school teacher, like her mother. Daughter Carrie went to live with her father in Michigan in 1992. David M. Jones, American, age 38, died April 19th, 1993. The eldest son of Perry Jones, it's the mailman who learned of the impending raid on February 28th and informed David. His dad and sisters, uh, Rachel and Michelle, were killed on April 19th. Of course, Perry, his father, survived by ex-wife Kathy, sons Mark, Kevin, and daughter Heather, who all came out during the siege. I think Heather was the last of the children to exit the building. David Koresh, American, age 33, died on April 19th, 1993. Original name was Vernon Howell. He visited Mount Carmel in 1991 to study under Lois Roden. Ended up, of course, changing his name to David Koresh and became uh, the leader of the uh, Branch Dominion Church at that time from uh, 1984 to 1993. Rachel Howell Koresh, American, age 24, died on April 19th, 1993, daughter of Perry Jones, who was killed on the first day of the BTF attack, February 28th, legal wife of David Koresh, sister of David and Michelle Jones, who were killed on April 19th. Uh, Rachel's three children also died on April 19th. Cyrus Howell, American, age eight, died on April 19th, 1993. He's one of the children. Uh, his mother was Rachel Howell Koresh, and his two younger sisters were also killed on April 19th. Uh, Cyrus was uh, David's um, firstborn male child. Star Howell. Um, of course, American, age six, died on April 19th, 1993. Mother Rachel Howell Koresh and her brother and sisters were also killed on April 19th. Star Howell. Bob, Bob, Bobby Lane Koresh, American, age two, uh, died on April 19th, 1993. Mother was Rachel Howell Koresh and her brother and sister were both killed on April 19th as well. Bobby Lane. We remember Jeffrey Little. Uh, Dana spoke of him earlier as well. Uh, one of Clive's best friends. <coughs> Jeffrey Little's American age 32, also died on April 19th, 1993. He was from Michigan and spent time in Hawaii. Computer expert, lived with Greg Summers in Hawaii for a period of time. Um, Jeff was almost shot on February 28th. Nicole E. Gent Little, Australian, age 24. This is uh, Peter Gent's sister. Uh, she died on April 19th, 1993. Twin brother, Peter Gent, was killed on the 28th. She's married to Jeff Little, who was killed on April 19th. Mother of Dalen and Pages, who died on April 19th. And mother of trauma-born infant, who also died on April 19th. Dalen L. Gent, age three, died on April 19th, 1993, died with his mother, Nicole Gent, little on April 19th. Dalen's two siblings were also killed on April 19th.
Pages Jen, age one, is that on April 19th, 1993, with her mother, Nicole. Uh, also, her two siblings on April 19th. Trauma-born baby Gent died April 19th, 1993. Her mother was Nicole. Nicole Gent Little. Baby's two siblings uh, were also killed on April 19th. Livingston Malcolm, British, age 26. Died on April 19th, uh, 1993. Livingston was quite a character. Very funny guy. He cracked me up all the time. His cousin to musician Bob Marley. He was, I saw a picture of him and the 24 different kids surrounded Bob Marley and the immediate family. Love telling that story and showing the pictures. One of 10 people in the chapel who were killed on April 19th in the fire as well, Livingston. Malcolm. Diane Martin, British, age 41, died April 19th, 1993. Uh, had traveled to Texas several times. Excuse me. Where did that just go? Had traveled to Texas several times to study with David. So she kept going back and forth and wanting to know more and ended up coming back and was, was there for, for April 19th, Diane Martin. <laughs> Douglas Wayne Martin, age 42, died April 19th, 1993. Uh, he was married to Sheila, who exited during the siege with Jamie. Had seven children. Four were killed on April 19th. Called 911 during the ATF raid, a very famous call, where he's asking people to uh, call it off. There's 100 armed men surrounding us here at Mount Carmel, and they're shooting at us, and we want him to call it off. He tried to negotiate a ceasefire at the very opening shots for the, in the very first few minutes of the, of, the, of the siege beginning, the ATF attacking pleaded with them to call it off. There was no communication between the ATF on the ground and the Sheriff's Department or the 911 resources. So there was no way to get that message to the agents on the ground because they didn't have a proper communication back then. And many people died because of the lack of the feds communicating with local law enforcement. Um, Harvard educated attorney and a law school librarian. He had a practice here within the, the, the city of Waco. Had many colleagues who spoke very highly of him uh, when he is greatly missed. He was a um, very deep individual, someone who I loved uh, spending time talking to, getting to know. Wayne Joseph Martin, American, age 20, also died on April 19th, 1993. One of the sons of Douglas Wayne and Sheila. Three siblings and father were killed on April 19th. Anita Marie Martin, American, age 19. Died on April 19th, 1993. Daughter of Douglas Wayne and Sheila. Uh, three siblings and father were killed on April 19th. We remember Sheila Renee Martin, American age 15. Died on April 19th, 1993. The daughter of Douglas Wayne and Sheila. Her three siblings and father were killed on April 19th. by Lisa Marie Martin, American age 13, died on April 19th, 
daughter of Douglas Wayne and Sheila. Three siblings and father also killed on April 19th. John Mark McBean, British, age 27, died April 19th, 1993. His mother and sister knew most of the British people at Mount Carmel. His sister, Janet McBean, was in California with a few other Davidians, branch Davidians in 1993. Bernadette Monbelly, British, age 31, died in April 1993, uh, friends with John Mark McBean's family, and um, was there with us during the siege. Rosemary Morrison, age 29, British, died in April 19, 1993, mother of Melissa, who was also killed on April 19th. And uh, she's among the people that are buried in Waco in uh, one of the graveyards outside of, in town um, here in Waco. Her daughter, Melissa Morrison, British, age six, died on April 19th, 1993. Died with her mother, Rosemary. She's also buried in Waco. Clive mentioned that many of the British subjects were buried here in Waco. They didn't make it back. They were just uh, left. They left here. <laughs> Families never claimed them, so they ended up here in Waco. Sonia Murray, British, age twenty-nine, died April nineteenth, nineteen ninety-three. Teresa Nobrega, I hope I said that right. Teresa Nobrega, British age 48, died on April 19th, 1993, of Portuguese descent, daughter of Natalie. Daughter Natalie was negotiated out during the siege. Uh, Teresa husband, Teresa's husband has kept in touch with Clive Doyle throughout the years. James L. Riddle, one of Clive's very close friends. Clive's told me many stories about Jimmy. He called him Jimmy Riddle. American, age 32, died on April 19th, 1993. He was from North Carolina. Great friends with Clive and Bonnie. Sister Rita Riddle came out during the siege. His niece, Misty Ferguson, was badly burned in the fire, but did survive um, and came out on April 19th, 1993. Juliette Centoyo was American, age 30. She died on April 19th, 1993. Of uh, Mexican descent, daughter of Ophelia Centoyo, who exited during the siege. She had five children who were killed on April 19th as well. Audrey M. Martinez. American age 13, died April 19th, 1993. Was, uh, her mother was Juliet Santoyo, who was killed on April 19th. Four siblings were also killed on April 19th. Audrey. Another one of Julie's daughters, Abigail Martinez, age 11, died April 19th, 1993. Her mother was Juliet Santoyo. Um, Four siblings were also killed on April 19th as well. Abigail. Joseph S. Martinez, age eight, died on April 19th, 1993. 
mother was Juliet Santoyo, who was killed on April 19th, and the four siblings were also killed on that day. Isaiah Barrios was also the son of Juliet. Julie, um, Isaiah, age four. <laughs> age four, but he was more like he was 13. That kid really kind of ran the roost. We played cards during the siege, and he often would look out and watch the tanks as they would go by the building, just fascinated. Bundle of energy, Isaiah, age four, died on April 19th, 1993. But there was Juliet Santoyo, four siblings were also killed on April 19th. Crystal Barrios, American age three, died on April 19th, 1993. Uh, her mother was Juliet Santoyo as well. Four siblings were also killed on April 19th. Uh, there's a, an audio tape of Crystal that's out there. It's in. It's featured in some of the um, featured in some of the the documentaries, and she's the one that got on the phone at one point with uh, the FBI negotiators and said, "Are you going to come in and kill me?" And they said, "No, dear, we're not going to come in and kill you." And she says again, "Are, are you going to come in and kill me?" This is after the original firefight, obviously. So that's whose voice is on that tape, Crystal Barrios. Rebecca Sapia, am I pronouncing that right, Clive? Mm -hmm. Rebecca Sapia, from New Zealand, age 24, died on April 19th, 1993. She was of Samoan descent. Sisters were Grace and Poya, who lived with David's group in Palestine, Texas area, era, uh, very early on. Steven Schneider, age 43, American, also died on April 19th, 1993. Uh, Steve was from Wisconsin, met David Koresh in Hawaii, and joined uh, David's group during the Palestinian Texas era. Steve was David's right hand man, he was quite a talker. We spent many, many nights talking deep into the evening about every subject you could possibly imagine. He was a taught comparative religions for a while. Um, very knowledgeable on, uh, on so many different subjects, just an amazing, brilliant person. Uh, joined David's group during the Palestinian area, uh, negotiated with the agents as well during the siege. He was, he spent more time on the phone than I think even David. Stephen was always trying to work, work it out with the agents. Judith Schneider. Judith Schneider, excuse me, age 41, died on April 19, 1993. She was wounded on the first day during the BATF attack and the, uh, the initial firefight, wounded in the hand on February 28th. A wife of Steve Schneider and mother of uh, Mena, who both died on April 19, 1993. Mina Schneider, uh, American, uh, age two, died on April 19th, 1993, with her mother, uh, Judith Schneider. Cliff Sellers, British, age 33, died on April 19th, 1993. He was the artist. He did... Oh, a lot of David's custom guitars. A lot of the um, a lot of the guys had motorcycles. He did their custom tanks. Um, he could develop the God Rocks T-shirt and the fiery flying serpent on the back were all his designs. Also, the banners that were put out during the siege. Rodney King, we understand. There was a banner that had uh, revelations of, of the different religious scripture indicating what was happening to us. That was all Cliff. He did all of that and put the banners out. And uh, he did all of the artwork. He was an incredibly gifted individual. He was born in Hong Kong. His father was in the military. 
he paints a new religious charge during the siege. And um, like I said, all, all the banners were, were, were cliff, cliff sellers. Scott Kijoro Sonobi. Kojiro. I always look at Clav if I think I'm pronouncing it wrong as I did. Scott Kojiro Sonobi. <laughs> Excuse me. American age 35. Uh, died on April 19th, 1993. He was a Japanese American. His father once came to Waco to thank David Koresh for straightening out his son's life. Married to Florcita, father to Crystal and Angelica Sonobi. Florisita Sonobi, American age 34, died on April 19, 1993. Filipino American, married to Scott, who also was killed on April 19th, mother to Crystal and Angelica, who were the first children to be sent out uh, during the siege. Gregory A. Summers, Greg Summers, American, age 28, died on April 19th, 1993. He's from New York. He was married to Aisha Garfus, worked with Judy Schneider, close friends with Peter Hipsman. Peter and Greg had a comedy routine they would often perform. Uh, Greg was also the individual that took care of the dogs, and he they negotiated somehow, I don't remember all the details, but they negotiated that Craig would go out to the front of the property across the, the our roadway, and he buried Peter Hipsman out front. I guess because they were they were, they were not Peter Hipsman. I'm sorry, Peter Jen. He buried out front. He put a cross down and then took the dogs that he had the Alaskan Malamutes that he had taken care of for that were shot by the BATF agents, and he lined them up in a line. There is a picture of that that we have to this day. So the press could see what they did to the dogs. And, you know, of course, a lot of the trial testimony indicated that some of the first shots were fired at the dogs at the raid. That's the first thing they did. Greg was uh, a very good friend of mine. He just uh, kept to himself. He uh, worked very hard and was just uh, an amazing, an amazing person to know. I'm, I'm glad to have known him. I miss him very much. Um, so. Gregory Summers. Aisha Garfis Summers, Australian descent, age 17. Died in April 19th, 1993. She was of a Hungarian descent, excuse me, came to Texas with brother Oliver, who exited the building during the siege and uh, was not tried, ended up back in Australia. Um, she's the mother of Startle and a trauma-born baby who died on April 19th, 1993. Remember Aisha. Startle Summers, age one, died on April 19th, 93 with her mother Aisha Garfis Summers. Trauma-born baby, Gyarfis Summers, and died on April 19th, 93. Lorraine Sylvia, American age 40, also died on April 19th, 1993, born in England, but from New Bedford, Massachusetts. Good friends of Sheila Martin. Married to Stan Silva, who was in California in 1993, her son, Joshua, was sent out during the siege. Uh, Lorraine died with her two daughters, Rachel and Hollywood, on April 19, 1993. Rachel Sylvia, American age 12, died on April 19, 1993. Died with her mother, Lorraine Sylvia, on that day.
Hollywood Sylvia, age one, died April 19th, 1993 with her mother, Lorraine. Michelle Jones Thibodeau, American, age 18. Michelle died on April 19th, 1993. Daughter of Perry Jones, who was killed on February 28th. Her mother, Maribel Jones, was not at Mount Carmel during the siege. She was living off the property. <clears throat> Sister of Rachel Howell Koresh and David Jones, who were both killed on April 19th. Michelle's three children were also killed on April 19th, 1993. Michelle. Serenity C. Jones, age four. Died on April 19th, 1993. She died with her mother, Michelle, on that day. Chica Jones, age 22 months, died in April 19th, 1993, uh, with her mother, Michelle Jones Thibodeau, twin of little one Jones. Little one Jones, age 22 months, died 19, April 19th, 1993. I'm not going to pronounce this right. Margarita Vega. Margarita Vega. Age 47. Died on April 19th, 93. Chinese. She was born in China. Came to Texas from Hawaii. Married to Neil Vega, who was killed on April 19th as well. Sent daughter Joanne out during the siege. Neil Vega, American, age 38, died on April 19th, 1993. Of Samoan descent, born in America when parents were traveling, is buried in Auckland, New Zealand. Mark H. Wendell, age 40, American, died April 19th, 1993. Mark is very well educated. He worked for several school districts in California. Married to Jadine, who was killed on April 19th. Also the father of four children who were sent out during the siege. We remember Mark Wendell today. That's the conclusion of the memorial. So the photographs of this presentation are the collection of Clive Doyle. Screenshots are from the inside Mount Carmel VHS tapes made during the siege. Uh, the rubbings of the property memorial name stones were used when a photo was not available. Again, we'd like to thank Matt D. Whitmer and Kathy Wessinger for compiling this and um, letting us use this all, all, all these years. We really, really appreciate it. And um, now that's the uh, conclusion. I'll leave it with the pictures up. So I thank everyone for being here. Do we want to open it up to questions? One, is there anyone here that would like to say anything? Clive, are you good? Okay. Sheila? Okay. Any anyone in the uh, in the in the Zoom world out there that would like have any questions or would like to say anything before we wrap it up? I just want to say one thing real quick. Um, I just want to tell Clive that I love him so much and I miss him. I can't wait to see him again. And please give him a big hug for me. And Heather as well. I love you, Heather. She's not in the room right now, but that's Kristen Hunstaker, of course. Hey, hi, Clive. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. I miss I miss uh, uh, being up there. And thank you, David, so much for reading all the names and, and thank Clive for reading the names for so many years. I mean, these memorials are really, really important for uh, all the things that uh, 
Tabor mentioned, uh, Goff mentioned, I think they're really critical. And as Kathy knows, I mean, it's just really important to continue to remember. And I appreciate everybody who spoke today. Thank you so much, Matt, for all that you have done. We really, really do appreciate it. I like thanks to for say being here. I like to say hi to each and every one, and my heart and prayers are with everybody out there. Thank you, Rachel. It's a great shirt you have on too, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Yeah, no. Kathy, yeah. everyone involved for making sure that this is continued. Wish we could all be there. Yeah, you usually are. <laughs> I'm glad you're here for the Zoom thing, however. It's nice to see you again, my friend. We'll be there next time if we, if, if if uh what is it systems allow you know we'll be there my there's not another used, my grandmother used to say god willing in the creek don't rise that's right but you're always there in my heart you know that david thank you sir kathy yeah sheila martin says hello to everyone by the way and she waved just like that too <laughs> Hello, Sheila Dudley saying hello to you. God bless you, girl. I might mention the kind of a link between me and some of them there. Perry Jones, he was a classmate of mine at the Davidic Levitical Institute at Old Mount Carmel. He was two years older than me. His wife, Mary Bell, I knew in 1944 in, in Southern California, my folks and my brother and I would pick her and her mother up and take them to the the Davidian meetings or the Shepherd's Rod meetings in in Los Angeles. And uh, when we returned them to their apartment, uh, Mary Bell and my brother and I, all within a year of each other, would be on the floor playing jacks <laughs> with ball and jacks while the adults are talking and all. So. As a, a real tie-in between my generation and the Davidians in Mount Carmel and the generation that you guys are all talking about that ended so tragically um, in, uh, in Waco there and particularly the death that I think of of my, my classmate, Perry Jones and, and Mary Bell. Uh, may God bless them. Let, uh, rest in peace. God bless all of you guys as you're as you are carrying on with what God has assigned you to do. Keep it up. Thank I'll you, Dudley. To be of help. You betcha. God bless you. And Clive Doyle. I, I love Clive. I've known him a few years now. Sorry that your health is not the best, but mine isn't either. So we're getting older. All right. Thanks for letting me air, speak a little bit on, on this memorial. Thank you, thank you. Our pleasure. Our pleasure, Dudley. Thank you for being here. Anyone else? Final words, thoughts? I'd like to. Uh... Oh, God. Was that five? What's next on the agenda? I, I'm not sure what's next on the agenda. What? Oh, we're gonna going out to eat together. Yeah. Well, yeah, I want to wrap up the Zoom thing first for those who can't make it with us. So, anybody else have anything final thoughts? I have a question, if it's all right. Sean, sure. How you doing, Sean? Good to see I'm you. I'm doing good. I wish I could have been there, guys. Sorry. Um, I heard earlier that David has surviving children. Um, how yes. how many? And do they ever plan to make the memorial or is that too much? Dana, are you still with us? Dana's got two. Um, boy, how many are there? There's four altogether? Yeah. Well, then there's Shay too. So technically, well, and you have to remember they were all super young or just babies. Yeah. So, well, I was just, I, I didn't know that. And that, that was very interesting. 
Yeah. Where they weren't really aware at the end, you know, they weren't involved like Dana and Robin had, had left. So their children weren't involved. So right. they didn't know us sure. really. And they also, you know, the mothers wanted their kids to have somewhat normal lives. So it's not something that was generally advertised or talk about quite a bit, but it is, you know, it is, um, it's, it's, it is it's history and they are still living in with us. So that's wonderful. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like yeah. I, it's like I said in the back of my book, and, and I, I feel when when they re-released my book, I did an epilogue, <clears throat> and I, you know, I, I feel for the children of Waco, all of them, the, the David David Crush's kids are not, they've all had to bear a burden of some kind. I mean, everyone like Heather's loss is tremendous. It was her entire family. It was her dad, her grandfather, her uncle, all of. David Crush's kids, same with, uh, you know, same with, with Kevin, were lost in this, in this tragedy. And, you know, I think of Crush's children all the time. I think of the kids that have had lost family members, mothers, fathers, and what their lives were, and the special burden that they have to, you know, go through without having those family members with them. And I just, there's nothing more I can do than wish them the greatest life they can possibly live. And I hope, despite it all, that they come through this and live their lives to do great things and live their lives to be happy and fulfilled to the best that they possibly can. And all those kids are with me all the time. I, th I think of them more so than, um, than you might think that I do. I know they're out there, and I just hope that they leave wonderful lives. I sincerely hope that for them. Scott, I think you had something to say. Yeah, on the uh, I just had to use the bathroom, so I kind of joined the conversation late. But it sounded like you were talking about the kids and stuff, and um, how they uh, didn't know uh, everything was going on. The parents who left early, they weren't as connected with what had happened there. And um, I just wanted to add a little bit to that of like how things transpired for the kids during that time in '93. Um, I know for myself. You know, I was there for the initial raid, but we left like two days afterwards. We went to a, a, a boy's home or something like that in between my father coming to pick us up. And after that, once my dad, I mean, basically from the minute we left Mount Carmel until I was an adult, I had very little to no knowledge or, or experience with what had transpired. We, my, my parents, after we left, didn't, you know, put on the news what was going on. We didn't, I, I didn't even witness the, the fire until, you know, <clears throat> I, I'm sure they probably told us that something had happened, but I didn't know the details of actually what had transpired. It wasn't until I, I got older into my, you know, uh, young adult to adult life that I began to to dig back into it myself and, and educate myself on what had actually transpired for the rest of the time. Um, this is one of the reasons that I say when people ask me questions about it and stuff like that, I can comment on my memories of what happened when I was there, but anytime they wanna ask, I mean, and, and most people tend to ask about the actual siege and then the fire at the end, all the great conspiracy questions and stuff all revolve around that last day. And I wasn't there for that. That's why I always, you know, well, these are the people you should talk to about that because I wasn't there for that. So um, just, uh, I would like everyone to understand and, and, and know that the perspective of a lot of the children really is lack of knowledge. We didn't know or understand what was going on there. And that's all I wanted to say on that. I think a lot of people that were on the ground didn't have a lot of knowledge of what was going on there. Um, you know, I know for a fact that some of the FBI guys that were on the ground had no idea that pyrotechnics were used at all because then, I mean, at one point an FBI guy was screaming, there was no pyrotechnics in that building. So they must have set the fire, he was saying to his friend. Of course, we know now there were pyrotechnics that, that, that were found and that were in the evidence locker. So, you know, I think many people, agents and 
Davidians alike. Um, it was easy to be in a specific area and have no idea what was going on in another area because you couldn't be there. Just as all the agents are on the ground, many of them believed wholeheartedly that no pyrotechnics were used. Um, yet some knew, some knew, and they're out there. And they knew that they were used because you, you can't refute that kind of evidence. So there's a lot that people didn't know. Is there anyone Dave, else? I that think has Valerie some... wanted to say something as well. Okay. I was just listening. I would just like to tell each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart, I haven't met you guys in person, but I remember seeing it way back from Ruby Ridge being on the TV, which we've become friends with Sarah Weaver. And then it was like nine months later, this happened at Mount Carmel. And I remember seeing it. And then when the series came out and I reached out and then to Thibodeau and then with the books and reading and then further investigating over the years myself, my heart goes out to you all because even a lot of people that may not come forward and say, hey, we knew something was really not right. And the media of lies and everything. There was a many, many people just like myself through the years that questioned and knew there was so much more to this. And I will forever tell people to remember exactly what you all were saying for all of you, the children, everybody. My heart goes out to you. My prayers go out to you all. And truth always prevails one way or another, whether we see it in this lifetime or not. God knows the truth, and I just want to send much love and prayers to each and every one of you all, and I just think you all are wonderful people that were demonized, and we all, there's people like me out here that know that's not true, so I just want to let you all know how much I care about you guys, and I will never forget. Thank you, Valerie. Absolutely. Hey, David, can you, can you hear me? Yep. I can no, you, no, can no. You see me all right? Eye off the yeah. screen. <laughs> hey, Who is um, it? I just want to say this is Doug. Can you see me? Hey, Doug. I can hear you. I can't see all you, right. but I can hear you. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to say number one, I wanted to say thank you guys very much for putting this together. Um, you know, for many of us who are always there in heart and in spirit, it's nice to be able to be here in this format. So I really appreciate you guys putting this together. It's just amazing. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much to uh, all the people that spoke today. Dana, your, your story was amazing. Uh, the journaling was, was just outstanding. Um, I want to second really quick, I want to second what Matthew had said about the importance of these. Um, and they are very much so, especially in this day and age. I think I've said it before that uh, this generation's thinker um, aren't content with the old, um, I told you so as an answer. It's not going to fly anymore. And I believe that uh, the truths that, uh, that you guys are educating and, and giving to listening ears now um, is just is, is crucial. Uh, and I just um, the things that you guys are doing uh, and have done to, again, um, continue the uh, legacy of the loss and, 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 the, and the people that are still around, uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's a good thing. It really is. And I'm, I'm proud to know you all. Again, hello to everybody there, uh, Clive, Ron, uh, just thinking about you guys all today. And, uh, you know, Heather, Scott, Kevin, I know you're out there too. Um, just wanted to say thanks again for, for doing this. I appreciate it a bunch. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, brother. That's we love you. Oh, happy birthday, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'd love to come down before there, we go, Dave. is there anybody? Else? What? I'd love to come down there and have Golden Corral with you, but um, I'd love for you to be there. Maybe, maybe another year in the future, I'll make it over again. It's just, it's been a while, and I'd love to yeah, make listen, it next back. Year, just... We got the thirtieth next year. We could probably try to make that one happen for next year. Maybe Scott and I'll come Nick, down next year. I would year. like to come down with you. You've gone down without me and I've gone down without you, but we <laughs> haven't been there together. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that next year. I, I miss you, David. I miss I miss Clive. I'll shut up now. 
No, it's okay. I'm so glad that you um, were part of this and, and, you know, get to speak your voice a little today. Uh, next year is going to be a big year, guys. The 30th Memorial. We're going to have a lot of featured speakers. We're going to start earlier. To, uh, next year is just going to be big. There's a, a lot going on. So I'm going to work. I'm going to work a lot this year to try to prepare for next year and um, talk about the projects, talk about the education. God, God bless podcasts. I'm so glad that podcasts have come into um, American culture and world culture because now you can, instead of the soundbite, we're no longer subject to sound bites through podcasts and through um, education. You can hear someone, what, what they think, what their thoughts are. You don't have to put it into a soundbite. You don't have to be, you know, that good, that polished. You can actually tell your story over a period of time. So I think we're going to see a lot of changes in this country and in this world because of that. Um, I just real quick before I wrap it, I want to talk about what's happening. ABC, CBS, NBC, um, CNN. These news sources no longer have the power that they used to. They no longer have that power. It's gone. It's There are more people listening to shows like The Hill and shows like Crystal and Sager um, breaking points on on YouTube that are listening to all three ABC, CBS, and NBC news shows combined. So there is a movement happening. People are demanding that they be told the truth and it's out there and you can find it. And there are now sources to find it, which that's exciting to me. I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. So I think we're gonna see a lot of changes in this country over the course of the next five, 10 years. Um, it's happening right now, it's happening right now. And uh, that, that's exciting. I'm glad that these news organizations that once had all control over what we were, were given, the thoughts that we think and the decisions that we make no longer are going to hold the power that they once did. Um, they're fading fast. And I thank God for that. And I think it's an exciting thing to be a part of. And I, I look forward to that in the future. I think that's a good place to end it. God bless everyone. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you for being here on the Zoom call. Um, again, I just gotta, I gotta thank Kathy Westinger one more time. We could not have done this without her. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you. And all, all the academics, wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Dana, you should try to get here next year too. You really added a lot to this this year and we appreciate it. <laughs>